Thank you for tuning in to the Read and Reaction Podcast. I'm your host, Nick Knudsen. On this episode, we'll cover week one reactions in college football. USF beat writer for Bulls 24-7, Wilt Turner, joins us to preview the Florida-USF game on Saturday afternoon in Raymond James Stadium as the Gators take a quick trip down to Tampa to play the Bulls. Uh, also had Ryan Winter on from Sports Chat 503, covers the Oregon Ducks, very knowledgeable about the program. I had an interview with him in the spring where basically taught us the, the whole history of the Oregon Ducks football program throughout the course of the interview. Uh, knows his stuff when it comes to the Ducks. And we'll look ahead to their game with the Ohio State Buckeyes at noon in the horseshoe on Saturday. Uh, we'll wrap up this with this week's picks. Uh, hopefully it goes a little better than last week. I know I had a couple of them, right? But, man. Rough week, rough week on the picks department. Uh, certainly some surprises out the gate in college football. So let's get to the week one reaction segment here. Of course, we're going to start at home with the Florida Gators. And before I dive in, let me just say, for the sake of Florida, the Florida reaction content, we do a show on this site called uh, Read, uh, on the Read and Reaction YouTube channel, rather, called Stand Up and Holler, where we give plenty of in-depth look at these games. So for the sake of not posting super repetitive content, I'll give you a quick summary. We'll call it the smoking notes version to for all you Gator grads out there, uh, the FAU Florida game. Uh, real quick, the Gators rush for over 400 yards and Anthony Richardson flashed in front of our eyes. I know a lot of us saw it during the Cotton Bowl. I was part of the crowd that really didn't overreact too much to it. I don't know how much was going on in that game. It was later in the game. Who was in for Oklahoma? You know, certainly he looked good, but I didn't read too much into it. Emory Jones is the entrenched starter coming into this season, and it wasn't even a question for me. Uh, after the FAU game, I'd say it's a question. Uh, it's a question. Uh, <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't like to think it's an overreaction to say that Richardson demonstrated that he has a higher ceiling than Emory Jones. It might be an overreaction to – judge Emory too much on one start, but I, I don't think it's incorrect to say that Richardson absolutely has a higher ceiling than Jones, but the real question surround this team doesn't matter what any of us think is, is how will Dan Mullen continue to use his two quarterbacks? I don't see him going away from Jones anytime soon. And we could see Jones given the opportunity to grow, continue to improve. I mean, I, as much as we, we saw Richardson, maybe we saw a great game from Richardson an average game from Jones, and maybe it'll on Saturday it'll be the opposite. So we still need to see more. We can't judge everything off of one game. Uh, but if Richardson keeps performing at a higher level, like we saw on Saturday, when, when do we got it? When do we got to maybe make the move and, and make Richardson the primary? I, it, it's it's a question that Dan Mullen gets paid a lot of money to answer. So uh, we certainly saw it with uh, the folks over in Tallahassee. Uh, we, we saw them stick with one quarterback for a little too long, and we saw how that went on Monday night. But obviously, I think we're in better shape at the quarterback position. We got This is a great problem to have, great problem to have for the Florida Gators. So it seems for now that Emory Jones is going to hold that spot, but we'll see how that goes going forward. And quite frankly, I, I, I can't be more excited for this season's offense still. I, we, we saw the running game go crazy against FAU. Uh, I'd like to see them pass the ball a little more with this USF game going in Alabama to demonstrate that we can do both, but maybe, maybe Mullins kind of keeping some of that stuff held back. We'll, we'll, we'll see how that goes. So looking forward to seeing another result on Saturday down in Tampa at USF. All right, let's dive into the rest of week one, starting with Presbyterian college. I I'm following what's going on at this school very closely this season. I've always been fascinated by the story of Kevin Kelly. He was the Arkansas high school coach at Pulaski Academy in Little Rock, who never punted. He ended up winning nine state titles. And, and granted, the media calls him the coach who never punts. Uh, it's a nice little moniker. But his innovation goes far beyond just following the analytics that say it's not really worth it to punt the ball. He, he will correct you and say he's punted eight times in the last 16 years, though. So there are some situations where he might do it. But – he also onside kicks almost every single time after after a touchdown goes for two more often than not. But his analytics extend far beyond just a few of those basic concepts where he likes he doesn't run a lot of routes that are curl routes. For example, he wants receivers in motion. 
at, at all times. He wants them catching the ball on the run. Basically, he has a lot of those concepts in his offense and, and the way they play defense to the way they practice is completely unique as well. I actually have an interview that I did with Coach Kelly last fall that I'm going to be posting on the Read and Reaction YouTube channel here uh, for everybody's viewing. Um, posted a, a Will Healy interview from Charlotte last week, by the way, from the, our old American Football Stories podcast. But Coach Kelly, fascinating story, watching it closely. And it, again, it's not just the 621 yards and 10 touchdowns that the quarterback put up. That's impressive. It's how they play the game. It's so fun to watch this team. I saw the, just the first half alone. I watched this game. This was on at four o'clock on ESPN Plus last week. And of course, you had Bama in the middle of destroying Miami. You had Texas and Iowa just working their way toward blowouts. There wasn't many great games in that time slot. So it wasn't hard to focus on this game. I think I saw three running back passes where they hand it off and the running back throws the ball. I, I mean, just the type of football, it, it looked like video game football in real life. And I'll tell you what, whether you snicker at it, whether you find it gimmicky, whatever you think of it, if this works, which by the way, they won 84 to 43 in his opening game. If this works, this is going to spread out in college football. It, it will happen. I mean, look at a school, like how long did it take at a school uh, like Ohio state to really introduce spread concepts in, in, in the land of, uh, you know, growing up, Woody Hayes is idolized in Columbus, Ohio. Three yards in a cloud of dust. He used to say three things can happen when you throw the football and two of them are bad. And now Ohio State has one of the most prolific passing games in the country. Evolution happens. Kevin Kelly might be the next wave of evolution in college football. I'm very much looking forward to how this experiment continues to work. If you're interested in watching this week's game, the Blue Hosts host Fort Lauderdale at 4 p.m. on ESPN+. Plus. Uh, you can at least tune in. You might not want to watch the whole game between Presbyterian College and Fort Lauderdale, but I would highly encourage you to tune in for at least a couple of drives. And, and just you'll see some concept that you sit there and go, wow, that's interesting. I mean, I mean it's different football, man. It's, it, it's, it's really a fun brand to watch. And I hope to, I hope to see C Coach Kelly continue to succeed because I'd like to see more of that uh, enter into the game. All right, let's go in to the Big Ten, where we opened on Thursday night with Ohio State escaping Minnesota with a two-touchdown win. And you might not look at that score and say that's escaping. That's a little bit of a strong word, but it's definitely deceiving. P.J. Flex Gophers, they pushed the Buckeyes on a rainy night in Minneapolis. The Buckeyes actually trailed 21-17 in the third quarter, and they really struggled to bottle up that running game, uh, that, that the Gophers running game throughout the night. But when Minnesota lost leading rusher Muhammad Ibrahim, who will end up missing the season with what they're calling a lower leg injury, but some have speculated might be a ruptured Achilles, the rushing attack never fully recovered for the Gophers. And I, I really I credit Ohio State for making plays down the stretch. That Minnesota team certainly looked highly competitive, though. And really some questions for the Buckeyes heading into – their home opener against Oregon this weekend. We'll talk about that more in an upcoming seg segment with Ryan Winter of Sports Chat 503. Let's go on to another game that happened on Thursday night. Boise State travels down to UCF. And look, UCF spent years whining about not being able to get home and homes with, with the big boys. This is the type of game you love to see them play, though. Get, get these group of five schools. I, Boise, Florida State was supposed to go out there on that blue turf. I know we've seen Oregon. I, we've seen some of the bigger Pac-12 schools play out in Boise a little bit. But UCF, this is the game. You should be scheduling Boise State almost every single year. I, I thought, and, and by the way, this game is group of five marquee matchup in my mind. Easily one of the best games of the weekend. Kickoff was delayed about two and a half hours due to lightning in the area. But – after forcing a punt on the opening possession, Gus Malzahn's offense marched down the field with little resistance until quarterback Dylan Gabriel ends up throwing. He, he had the guy in the back of the end zone. If he puts the throw in the back of the end zone, he has it. Short throw, Boise State picks it off, takes it 100 back the other way for a touchdown. 7 nothing Broncos. They use that momentum to run it up to 21 to nothing, And UCF looked like they were in serious trouble but with that offense, you can't count out the Knights. I, I, Dylan Gabriel, I know he's a little sloppy. I know he makes some questionable throws at times. But one of the better quarterbacks in this entire country. 
I, and I look forward to watching this offense on a week to week basis. Uh, UCF worked their way back, scoring 28 points in the second and third quarter to ultimately take a 28 to 24 lead. Boise State gets they they give up a safety on the next possession on a bad snap. UCF up 31 24 before Boise State ends up making UCF pay with another touchdown after Gabriel interception. So two Boise State touchdowns, a direct result of Gabriel interceptions there. But luckily for Malzahn, Gabriel leads the team right back down the field for the winning score late in the fourth quarter. UCF holds off one last serious threat from Boise State to hold on to a 36-31 victory in a marquee matchup for the group of five. Awesome play uh, on the interception. Uh, the, the athletic director, new athletic director from UCF, if you go back and watch the replay on that last interception, you'll see a guy fist pumping on the sideline like a huge fan, and it's the new athletic director at UCF. So enjoy that clip if you see it. The other thing with that last interception, the Boise quarterback was clearly two yards over the line of scrimmage when he threw the ball and not, not called a penalty, not addressed at all by the announcers. They just moved on like nothing happened. If you go back and freeze it, though, watch where he released that ball. He's clearly two yards over the line of scrimmage. I'm not sure why that wasn't picked up uh, at all during that game. Uh, maybe they were just wanting to get out of there. Two-hour rain delay, man. Maybe everybody's ready to go home probably <laughs> in that game. Uh, South Florida, the Bulls, USF. We'll talk about this game more with Will Turner from Bulls 24-7. Uh, but the simple thought on it, just completely outgunned here. USF is not ready to play with big-time football teams right now. Jeff Scott's got a massive rebuild on his hands. We'll get into that with Will Turner in our interview segment. But they give up over 500 yards. NC State cruises to a 45 nothing victory over USF. Another Thursday night game of note, the Tennessee Volunteers welcome Bowling Green from the MAC into Rocky Top. Bowling Green is expected to be one of the worst teams in the MAC this year. Uh, so this was something where you wanted to see, even though the Vols are not expected to do much either, this is definitely a game where if they have anything going their way where you'd want them to jump on it, and it was 14-6 to six at halftime. Yeah. Uh, Tennessee, though, they end up using a 24 nothing run to bury them in the second half and end up winning 38-6. to six. So it looks like a blowout. But it wasn't the prettiest game. It wasn't the prettiest game. Uh, 326 of the 471 total yards were picked up on the ground as Tennessee just basically manhandled, over o- overwhelmed Bowling Green uh, physically. But not much to speak of in the passing game. You would have liked to see a little more from Tennessee there if you're a Vols fan. Uh, Pitt visits Rocky Top this weekend. Tennessee will have to play a lot better to get a, a victory over the Pitt Panthers. All right, let's go into the ACC here where we had one of the first big upsets of the weekend. And I'll say this. I had some reservations about this North Carolina team coming in this season. Number 10. It, it's in line with the hype you, you hear with like a school. Not, not that old. People don't have old, uh, a lot of expectations for Ole Miss because they're playing in the same division with Alabama and Texas A&M. But I, I kind of put North Carolina in that old Miss category where just a competitive team, they can pop off on any given game. Definitely a dangerous team. I'm not sure if they know how to bring it week to week just yet. That being said, I didn't think that they would lose this game against Virginia Tech. Uh, we have not seen much from the Hokies under the Justin Fuente regime here in Blacksburg. But Virginia Tech quarterback Braxton Burmeister – he didn't light up the stat sheet, but he did put together an eight play in a 12 play touchdown drive in the first half, which really proved to be enough because this Vatek defense was filthy. Sam Howell, a Heisman candidate and potential first round draft pick, he was harassed all night by, by a Hokies defense, which posted nine tackles for a loss and six sacks. How couldn't catch a break? Uh, you watch that game. I, I watched a lot of, of the fourth quarter in this one. And it's, it felt like every time North Carolina would do one positive thing, they'd do two negative things or they'd have a setback drive over. Hal was trying his damnedest there at, at the end of the game. I mean, there's there's that one clip of him where one of his interceptions, he's literally being spun in a sack. He's just getting rid of the ball because they would have had to punt. If it was either a fourth down player, they would have had to punt. Forgive me. I, I don't have the exact information on that at this second. I was just doing that off of memory. But Hal – put the ball on a couple of guys and just was getting drops. He just, he wasn't catching. Not only was he not getting any blocks up front, 
but he wasn't getting much help from his receivers. So I, you'd like to think a Heisman candidate is going to go in and handle his business in this game, and we did not see that from Sam Howell or the North Carolina Tar Heels. And quite frankly, if Georgia didn't do what they did to Clemson on Saturday night, which we'll get to in a minute, I think the Hokies are the team we'd be talking about coming out of week one. That defensive performance was awesome, and it deserves a ton of praise. So great start for the Hokies and Justin Fuente to the 2021 season. Um, let's go down to Charlotte where the 49ers – Another nominee for the one of the best games of the weekend. I Duke versus Charlotte. A little biased in this one. Did the Will Healy interview posted on the Read and Reaction channel? So I, I I will be openly rooting for Charlotte this season. Will Healy and Charlotte scored their first win in school history over a Power Five opponent with the last minute touchdown drive against Duke. But really, what I want you to check out is go check out the highlights and, and Mateo Durant, the running back from Duke, had electric runs all over the field ends up running for three TDs and 255 yards on the night. Great performance by that back. And like I said, be sure to check out the interview on the read and reaction YouTube channel with Will Healy uh, that we did uh, this summer uh, on American football stories. All right. Final result here from Friday night, Michigan state gets what I would call a mild upset here, 38 to 21 over Northwestern. Uh, in Evanston, that's a nice win. Friday night victory, 38-21 to 21 over the defending Big Ten West champs. Mel Tucker's second team used a fast 21 nothing start to bury Northwestern early and Pat Fitzgerald's teams. They're not really built from playing behind. These Northwestern teams are scrappy. They play good defense, and they want they, they need to be in it throughout the game. If you get that, get them down early, those aren't you're not going to see that type of explosive offense like a UCF to where they could just work their way back in quickly. They put they have more methodical drives and uh, rely heavily on the running game. So I, I that's twenty one nothing hole. Northwestern's not coming out of that under Pat Fitzgerald. Uh, the Wildcats though they always seem to struggle early in the season. So I'm not sure how much I'm reading into this result one way or, or another. We saw Michigan State upset Michigan a week after losing to Rutgers at the beginning of last season, but. The one thing I'll give Michigan State fans to get excited about is you saw some offense. You haven't seen that in the last few years. The quarterback play has been horrendous, but even the running game has struggled in, in East Lansing. And you put up over 500 yards in this game, 326 rushing. Uh, when offense has been pretty scarce, you'll take about any positive signs you can get. And it was a positive sign on Friday night for Michigan State, uh, hopefully building on something in year two of Mel Tucker. All right, on to the Saturday games here. Let's start at the top. Number one, Alabama just thrashes Miami and Atlanta, 44 to 13. Roll, roll damn tide, I guess. I, I, I don't – there's not much shocking to talk about here. Didn't expect this one to be overly close. Alabama deserves the benefit of the doubt with new players coming into new roles at this point. I, we've just seen it too many times to not think that they're going to be excellent year in and year out. Not only did quarterback Bryce Young step right in and throw a 37-yard touchdown on his opening drive, but clips of the Bama O-line are just flooding Twitter this week. So many clips of them just wrecking uh, a respectable Miami defensive front. And uh, Bama finishes with over 500 yards of offense. Derek King, the Miami quarterback, coming off an ACL tear in December. He was limping around at one point. My first thought was get him out of the game immediately. You do not need this game, Miami. This is not your weight class right now. Protect him. Protect him so you can protect the rest of your season. Uh, regroup. Try to compete in a very winnable ACC Coastal Division. We just talked about Virginia Tech knocking off North Carolina. Miami can certainly compete in that class. Alabama is just in another stratosphere of college football right now. Uh, there's really – you don't take this one too hard if you're a Miami fan. And you, you almost – I know some Miami fans are probably sitting there thinking that that's a joke, but you haven't shown it, Miami. You're not even close. You're not even close to, to where Bama is at the moment, and I, I don't know how many programs are. So we get to see it firsthand in the swamp next week, and I can't wait because, I, I mean, you, you always want to measure yourself against the best, and, uh, you know – I'm going to be fully deluding myself into thinking that we're, we're going to pull that upset. Like, I, like Steve Spurrier said, we're going to pull that upset. I'll have myself convinced of that by September 18th, but I need time to get there. Well, the number two team in the country 
did not have it as easy. The Oklahoma Sooners hosting Tulane after originally supposed to travel down to New Orleans. They end up coming back to Norman, Oklahoma, thanks to Hurricane Ida. Um, the Sooners, I believe they ended up donating their gate to Tulane. So I thought that was a good way for them to help out. That was a nice story up there uh, for the folks at OU helping out uh, a school that definitely could use it after uh, losing what would have been probably the biggest home game that they played in, in the history of that new stadium down in New Orleans at Yuleman Stadium. Uh, certainly a nice place to watch a game if you're ever in New Orleans. Uh, Oklahoma ends up escaping, though, 40 to 35. And if I told you that Oklahoma scored 40 and passed for over 300 yards, most Sooners fans probably would have taken that before the game. But Tulane in their incredible looking unis, I, I just love that angry wave, wave logo. Uh, roll wave, baby. Uh, they end up recovering an onside kick with a shot to win it on the final drive. Preseason Heisman front runner, Oklahoma quarterback Spencer Rattler goes 30 for 39. Okay. 304 yards, only throws one touchdown, throws two picks. The big issue with those two picks, though, Tulane cashes in on both with two touchdowns. Uh, Overall, this goes down as a survive and advance type of day for the Sooners, but there are plenty of questions remaining about that defense. Uh, Oklahoma has a chance to clean things up this weekend when Kerwin Bell's Western Carolina Catamounts come to Norman for a visit. Got to see some improvement on that defensive side of the ball if you're an Oklahoma fan. Let's go back to Charlotte. Georgia ends up with a 10-3 to win over the number three Clemson Tigers. And really just a nasty Georgia defensive front made Clemson look silly all night. They held the Tigers to under 200 total yards of offense, which is just shocking to me. I'm still blown away. People talk about that game being boring and it wasn't a super interesting watch. I, I welcome the return of defensive football. I mean, look, it would have been more fun to see them go up and down, play a track meet. Yeah, I, I prefer that, but – after last year where people are trying to declare the death of defense in college football, it's good to see some good, strong defenses winning some games this year. A pick six ends up giving Kirby Smart's program their biggest win since the 2017 Rose Bowl as the Bulldogs defeat the Tigers despite not finding the end zone once on offense. I expected the Clemson defense to give JT Daniels a, some difficulty, but I didn't expect – to completely keep them out of the end zone the way we saw on Saturday. So it, it's it's fun to see defense make a return to the top of college football in 2021. And with Saturday night's win in Charlotte, you got to look at that Georgia schedule. And that's one of the reasons why a lot of people like Georgia in the preseason. They just have a very favorable schedule this year. And you look at it heading into the cocktail party. Uh, up next for the dogs here. Home games against UAB and South Carolina. A road trip to Vandy. Arkansas at home at Auburn versus Kentucky. So outside of the road trip to Auburn, Kentucky and Athens might be the biggest threat to Kirby and the Bulldogs. And and really you're you're looking at this win against Clemson, setting up potentially a massive game in Jacksonville with the Florida Gators on Halloween weekend. So I'm thinking the dogs are walking into Jacksonville unbeaten, maybe number one or number two in the country, depending on, uh, how things go with Bama here in a couple of weeks. Like I said, I'm going to get there. I'm going to get there on my delusion. We're going to pull that upset. We're going to do it. Uh, I'm not, I'm not quite there yet, but I'm working on it. Anyway, dogs going to be unbeaten heading into Jack's. So the Gators will have another shot at, at one of the top two teams in the country this season. Fresno state goes into Oregon 24, 24 late in the game. Ducks pull away. They end up scoring a late touchdown. Keep at, uh, upset-minded Fresno State team at bay here. And I'll discuss this game more in depth with Ryan Winter uh, when he comes on to preview the Oregon-Ohio State game. Big Ten football, big new kickoff. Penn State 16, Wisconsin 10. And, man, this was a difficult loss for the Badgers. Uh, it was a gross 0-0 slugfest in the first half. It, like, I like defense, but this whole 0-0 stuff, I, that was tough to watch. There was just some bad offensive football at times in this game. Uh, it wasn't all great defense, <laughs> but it ends up leaving us uh, some big moments in the second half. Four Wisconsin drives inside the Penn State 10-yard line netted the Badgers a single touchdown. 
The other three ended in a fumble, a blocked field goal, in an interception, and Wisconsin has nobody to blame but themselves for this loss. On the other hand, nice win for James Franklin and the Penn State Nittany Lions. Tough start to 2020. Ended up rebounding, winning a couple games down the stretch, and looks like they're carrying some of that momentum over into 2021 as Camp Randall. For those of you who don't follow the Big Ten too closely, that's a tough place to win. The Badgers play everybody tough in their in their home stadium there, Camp Randall. Uh, neither offense looked particularly good, but again, this game was a lot like the Virginia Tech uh, UCLA. Uh, I'm sorry, Virginia Tech UNC Clemson UGA. We saw some defense, seen some defenses improve here in 2021. I think that's a positive sign for college football. All right, San Jose State USC. The Trojans end up with a 30 to seven victory here in Los Angeles. This was a game that I thought the Mountain West champs of San Jose State, I thought they had a shot at giving the Trojans a hard time. And heading into the fourth quarter, it was 13-7. to seven. Again, a defensive struggle. I, I, I thought it would be more high scoring here. But Drake London for USC ends up with a career high, uh, 12 catches for 30, 137 yards. Greg Johnson for the Trojans returns a late interception, 37 yards for a touchdown. And USC needed well into the fourth quarter to really make it look like a, a blowout here at 30 to seven. But San Jose State played tough all day. And once again, not a super impressive victory in the Clay, Clay uh, Helton era. So continued. It looks like it looks like more of the same for USC basically in 2021. So we'll we'll take a peek at the Trojans every now and then. They have Stanford coming up this week. Let's stick in Los Angeles and talk about the UCLA Bruins defeating the LSU Tigers 38-27. LSU could not get by those sissy blue shirts, as Coach O. Geron said, walking into the Rose Bowl. Such a great line. Got Coach O got those USC ties. He knows how to t- smack talk those UCLA fans. Uh, but UCLA, they're trying to use that in all their social media. But I still give the win to Coach O there. That was just that was just funny. You don't see you don't see coaches respond much so it's always good to see uh, coach jump in and engage with the fans i get credit to coach o for having some fun with the fans on that one uh the bruins they end up landing the biggest win of the chip kelly era by beating lsu on the ground coach o's tigers they end up despite being in the game in the fourth quarter they're down 24 to 20 they end up with only 49 rushing yards on 25 attempts against 46 pass attempts and really, when you came into this game, you thought LSU would have the advantage up front. Turns out UCLA, though, they end up running the ball 47 times while racking up 260 total yards through the air on just 9 of 16 passing. So a lot of big plays through the air for the Bruins and really tough running game to stop all night long. Uh, UCLA has certainly improved under Kelly, and I don't want to take anything away here from the Bruins, but – LSU seems to be in for another season of finding themselves after their magical 2019 run. Uh, a lot of people were hoping for them to maybe regain some form this year. I don't think anyone expected 2019, but maybe a little better than what we saw in 2020. Certainly a tough road trip for, for the Tigers to open up with. You would have liked to see them get a game under their belt like UCLA had with Hawaii, but it didn't happen that way. So not, not writing off LSU completely, but – if you're talking about LSU's expectations or what to compete for the West and compete with Alabama, not looking like that's going to happen in 2021. Next up, Iowa city where the Hawkeyes deal the Hoosiers at 34 to six beating. And I, I, I don't think I'm the only one who expected more from the Hoosiers in this one. I picked them to cover and uh, boy, it, it was not close. Indiana had a solid team last year, a lot of returning pieces from that squad. And I thought Tom Allen would go in there and, and be a tough out for Iowa, but Iowa dominated from the get go. They end up using two first half pick sixes to run up a 31 to three score at the half. And I think they sent a message to the nation here heading into the Iowa state game all off season. You just hear about Iowa state, Iowa state, Iowa state, Game day is going to be on location in Ames, Iowa on Saturday when the Hawkeyes travel there. And I think Iowa is going to be primed and ready. Uh, I'm not going to sleep on the Hawkeyes again after this game. That was a good win for Iowa heading into a massive battle with Iowa State this week. Uh, Another surprising result. Montana goes up into Seattle, beats the Washington Huskies 30 
13 to seven and a real head scratcher here to start year two of the Jimmy Lake era. Washington, they, they, they lose to not only lose to an FCS school, although it's a good FCS team in the playoffs constantly, we've seen Montana make deep runs in the FCS playoffs, but you end up scoring a touchdown in the opening drive and then not score again the rest of the game. Three interceptions for the Grizzlies defense. And really, to me, the impressive stat, too, is the Grizz offense possessed the ball for over 11 minutes on two fourth-quarter scoring drives. And that that was a real difference in the game that allowed Montana to score this monster upset uh, to give the folks back in Missoula something to celebrate. So good win by the Montana Grizzlies. Washington left with more questions and answers as they head east for a Saturday night showdown in the big house in Ann Arbor with the Michigan Wolverines. Uh, That one will be on ABC. Another game that I expected a little more from the underdog in, Texas gets a 38-18 to victory over the Louisiana Ragin Cajuns. Texas is back, baby. Uh, I think that's what we're supposed to say after they take care of business at home against the Sunbelt team, right? Uh, I think that's something where in previous years, you might have seen this Louisiana team give Texas a little more trouble, but I don't think Steve Sarkeesian took them lightly. Uh, The Horns came out. They were ready to go. They stepped up. They took over in the second half and pulled away. Made the game look the way it should if you're a Texas fan. Uh, I was hoping this would be the, the game of the afternoon. And, you know, pull us away from the torture that is watching Alabama dominate yet another opponent. But Texas really laid it on the Raging Cajuns and gave Steve Sarkeesian an impressive opening win over a quality opponent. Um, The Hogs playing, playing Texas in week two here, Arkansas. The Hogs end up struggling in week one. But if Texas goes up to Arkansas and handles their business again, we might see this Longhorn team make a run uh, into the Oklahoma game unbeaten because I think their schedule is fairly favorable. But I'm not ready to totally have faith in Texas just yet. We'll see how that goes. So Texas heading up into SEC country to play Arkansas this weekend. Uh, good luck to Sam Pittman and the Hawks. Uh, Western Michigan traveled to Michigan uh, 40 Michigan gets the win 47 to 14. Just wanted to check in on the Wolverines as they prep for Washington. Cade McNamara looked the part of QB. Michigan handles their business the way you'd expect. Bad news for the Wolverines, though. Senior wide receiver Ronnie Bell out for the year with a knee injury suffered in this game. Another Big Ten check in. Rutgers 61 to 14 over Temple. Just that score caught my eye. Temple's had a, a decent program over the years, and Rutgers has been way down. So to see that type of score, year two of the Greg Shiano era kicks off in a big way. The Scarlet Knights ran the ball 51 times for 221 or 220 yards. And on the defensive side, they forced five Temple turnovers, three fumble recoveries, and two picks. Rutgers has a chance to run to 3-0 as the Knights head to Syracuse and host Delaware in the next two weeks before their big First test in Ann Arbor in a few weeks here. Uh, Holy Cross, another FCS upset, 38 to 28 over UConn. One of the better highlights in the weekend with the big fella pick six. If you didn't see that one, go check that out. Uh, big man gets a gets a pick six. I always love seeing those touchdowns. UConn, though, they sat out of football last season. They start this season with two terrible losses. They got blown out by Fresno State last week. It spells the end of the second Randy Edsel era in stores, Connecticut. Uh, the Huskies, they end up playing. This is the same program that played in the Fiesta Bowl under Edsel a decade ago, and they've shown no signs of life since then. So I think you got a chance with this program to build something. It's been done before, but they really need to be reinvigorated. If I'm the UConn staff, I'm going after a young, enthusiastic coach who can just really recruit. You, you want that big-time recruiter coming in there. Give a guy a chance that maybe it's too early in his career for him to get a head job elsewhere, but get, take a chance on a guy like that. That's what you need at UConn. You need to be reinvigorated right now. Let's go down to Jerry World in Dallas, Texas, Kansas State, 24, Stanford 7. And this one, whew, putrid Stanford offense. I, I, I only could stomach a few minutes of this game. Uh, <laughs> it was, it was not pretty. It was not pretty. And this is not the Stanford football team that we watched, uh, for much of the last decade here. 
Uh, 39 yards total of rushing offense against Kansas State. Uh, the Cardinals stays out of the end zone until the fourth uh, quarter. Uh, fourth quarter in this one. This game took place in Jerry World in Dallas, like I mentioned. And I'm going to go ahead and say this. It, this might be one of the most unnecessary neutral site games of all time, Stanford and Kansas State. Um, you know, it's one thing if it's a bowl game, but what, what are we doing here? Like, I, I already – I'm not a huge fan of the neutral site games. There's a few times where it works. I thought the atmosphere for Georgia and Clemson looked pretty good up in Charlotte, but you're kind of in the neighborhood of those two schools. Kansas State <laughs> – is not exactly around the corner from Dallas and Stanford certainly isn't. So not, not sure why they're doing that game at Jerry world, but whatever. It's a loss like this that makes you start to wonder about the future of David Shaw at Stanford. It's been proven that he can win there. He's developed NFL talent since Harbaugh's left. I, he's had good recruiting classes on his own. Stanford's certainly a difficult place to, to win. I, if I'm Stanford, I'm holding on to David Shaw as long as possible, and maybe that's the way they feel. But if you if you look at the Stanford program, they've certainly lost some momentum, a little bit of luster. Even when they're losing, they've been developing NFL talent, so there's some talent on that roster still. Uh, it just doesn't feel like it did about five years ago out in uh, Palo Alto. Maybe – just it's time for a change of scenery in general. Maybe there's a fatigue factor. You hear that sometimes where coaches kind of lose the program over time. I, I don't know what's going on at Stanford right now, but the last few seasons here have not been awesome. And certainly uh, David Shaw can land a job anywhere tomorrow, but is St does Stanford feel like they need to get a, a shot in the arm at some point in this program? It'll be interesting to watch throughout the season. I don't see Stanford making a lot of noise. They're heading to uh, USC this week. I don't see them making a lot of noise in the Pac-12 this year. That's a decision Stanford's going to have to make at some point, though. All right, let's come down south to the SEC. Mississippi State gets a 35-34 victory over Louisiana Tech. I enjoyed watching the Mike Leach comeback, but <laughs> Mississippi State had to dig their way out of a 21-point hole in this one. What are you doing? What are you doing, Bulldogs? This, this Bulldog team, they don't have a great shot at going bowling, but if they have any chance at it, it, it lies in at least going 3-1 and one in their non-conference slate. And I'll give them the one loss because the next two weeks, NC State comes to town, and then they have to go on the road to Memphis. So this was not a game the Bulldogs could afford to lose if they have a shot at going bowling. And thankfully for, for them, they come back and win this one. Low expectations for this Mississippi State team overall this year, but way to scrap out a win early in the season. Uh, Nebraska gets a 52-7 to win over Fordham. They're on the right side of things with an FCS victory uh, over the Rams. Uh, really, shout out to Arthur Avenue in the Bronx, by the way. If you're ever in New York City and you want a good Italian meal, Arthur Avenue right up by the Fordham campus. Great spot to find a meal. Uh, Fordham linebacker racked up 31 tackles in this game. And maybe Nebraska fans could not beat themselves up too much about that loss to Illinois. Maybe the Illini are better than we thought. Uh, oh, wait. Oh, wait. The UTSA Roadrunners just walked in to Brett Bielema's house and handed Illinois a big fat loss, 37 to 30. The Illini cannot get past UTSA. It's not great times in Lincoln right now. What, what can you say? What can you say? Uh, while we're in the little stretch of misery here, let's, let's talk about Georgia Tech. NIU goes down to Atlanta, gets a gutsy call by their head coach. They score a touchdown in the final minute of the game, end up going for two. Uh, completing a pass for a 22 to 21 win. The offense rewards the confidence of the coach there. Jeff Collins, he's eating a ton of Waffle House. He's repped the 401, uh, the 404 hard on social media. I, I, I think he's done an admirable job in trying to rebrand that Georgia Tech program from its days of the triple option under, under Paul Johnson, which obviously would limit your ability to recruit if you're running in a very specific offense like that. Collins has given, uh, been given a pass the first couple of seasons of, of his tenure in Atlanta. I don't know if you're going to see that pass with, with this type of loss though. I, I think at, at this point, the jackets are expecting some results and I don't think they're expecting to compete for ACC titles here. Beating Northern Illinois at home, 
got to get that figured out, Georgia Tech. And, and I know the quarterback got hurt in this one for, for the Jackets at some point, but th- this one's going to raise a few eyebrows. Uh, the on-field results, they haven't been consistent for Collins yet, but I just love the energy he brings to the program. I think Georgia Tech would be insane to give him less than five years to revamp a huge rebuild uh, with what he had to inherit there. Not saying the Jackets were a bad team under Paul Johnson, just saying it's a complete change in operation. And you spend a couple of years convincing people that you're going to change, and then you actually have to show some results on the field. I think if you stick with Jeff Collins, I think those results will come, but that's not a great way to open your third season there in, in at Georgia Tech there, Jeff Collins. East Tennessee State goes into Vandy. Uh, 23 to three. Uh, we'll keep, we'll, we'll stick with the misery vortex here. Uh, Vanderbilt, just the, the nothing, nothing here. Managed only 85 yards on 31 rush attempts. The Buccaneers earned their first win over a power five program since 1987. And after the game, new Vandy coach Clark Lee said, this has always been a, about a vision of the future at Vanderbilt. It's never about just playing East Tennessee state on September 4th. This is about how we build this program to sustain success over time. And this can be a, a critical learning moment as we move forward. Let's hope it is. I, I Look, I do not have expectations for this Vanderbilt program this season. They, they inherited a mess down there, uh, this Clark Lee staff. I like the approach they're taking with recruiting and hiring. I think they're doing some different things out there with uh, Barton Simmons coming in from 24-7 Sports. If you've watched Stand Up and Holler, you've heard Will and I mention this a few times with this Vandy program. And I, I, I'm i curious. I think they're an experiment right now in college football. They're one of the experiments I'm watching. I think Clark Lee, he's an alum. He understands the program. And let's be real, at the end of the day, uh, this this will not define anything uh, about his time at Vanderbilt, although you'd like to, to see him beat an FCS program. Come on. I, I, I don't want to give let him off the hook that easy. So. Not a good day for Vanderbilt in this one, but you got you got a few years to rebuild. I want to see that quote after Alabama comes in and smacks you. I don't I don't want to see that quote after losing to East Tennessee State. Let's have some level of expectation, coach. Uh, Nevada goes into Cal and hands the Bears a twenty two to seventeen loss. Uh, this was my Pac twelve after dark game of choice this week. A stifling Bears defense against a potential first round pick quarterback Carson Strong in a high powered Nevada offense. Who would give first? Uh, we saw early on the Bears defense, they they dominated early on, but over the course of the game, they end up surrendering 312 passing yards. Even though they completely shut down the running game and made Nevada pretty one-dimensional, 61 rushes on 26 attempts for the Wolfpack, Cal ends up taking a 14 nothing early lead, and the Wolfpack end up having to chip away. In the second half, they finally overtook the Bears, and they didn't look back. They, they thwarted a couple late Cal attempts, uh, to, and end up stealing the win on the road against one of the better defenses in the Pac-12. I know the Cal Bears don't strike fear in anybody's heart in, in the SEC part of the country, but uh, that defense can play out there under Justin Wilcox. Uh, Sunday, September 5th, Notre Dame goes down to Florida State and, and just barely survives with a 41-38 to victory in overtime. There are a ton of explosive games on both sides of the ball in this one, but did not look great early on for the Knowles. I don't know if I was the only one screaming at the television. Why is Mackenzie Milton not getting a look? Like I, even if Jordan Travis, apparently Jordan Travis beat him out in camp and Milton didn't have a great camp. Okay. But why, why bring the guy in if you're not even going to give him a look in this type of game? I, I didn't understand that at all. So the whole game, they keep Travis in that offense for Florida state is really struggling. I mean, they 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 have, they pop some big plays. Travis hit a nice uh, a nice long pass at one point, but the guy who he threw to was about had uh, had a few yards on the defender. All he had to do was complete the pass. It wasn't like he let. It wasn't like uh, he created the play. The guy was just wide open. I love Travis's athleticism. Let me say some good things about him here. The guy knows how to run the ball. He, he certainly – I think he might be one of the better athletes on the team in general. I just don't see the downfield potential. You play this guy, you're going to have eight-man fronts all season, and you're going to be running into them because he can't pass the ball. He cannot pass the ball down the field very effectively. And I, like I said, he did hit on that one long pass, but he's not going to consistently beat you downfield. So 
I'm not sure what the issue was with McKenzie Milton and camp that he could not beat out Travis. That's concerning in and of itself, but Milton coming back from a devastating injury. It, it, it's clear that after the first couple of series, he still has a much higher ceiling than anything that Travis could offer the Florida state offense, which is why I could not understand why Mike Norvell did not put Milton in for a driver two, and that we needed to wait for Jordan Travis to lose a helmet in the fourth quarter to see McKenzie Milton. What kind of decision-making is that by the head coach? I, I really can't understand that. But luckily for FSU fans, Travis loses the helmet, had to exit for a play. Milton steps right in, fires a completion downfield. It's the first time we've seen a semblance of a passing game. And all of a sudden, Norvell's like, oh, let's just try this guy out. <laughs> Ends up leaving him in. Honestly, before overtime, Milton threw a ball away. It was a bad snap. Ends up throwing the ball away uh, it, it, to save a field goal position. I, even just the intelligence there. You're, you're going to get a guy that gets rid of the ball quickly. You're going to have a guy that makes quick decisions. I saw him run a couple times, and I held my breath every time he did. I, I wish he would not. I, I, would be, yeah, I would have strict instructions for him not to run unless you can run five yards without anybody touching you and run out of bounds cleanly. Other than that, do not run, Mackenzie Milton, please, for the sake of everybody. Uh, but this loss, it's, it, it, they end up losing the game. They get to overtime. A couple of bad snaps really do them in if you want to put it on one thing at the end of the game. Uh, but what what is Mike Norvell thinking, though, waiting that long? I, I, I don't understand why he wouldn't at least have given the shot to Milton. FSU's offense seems to have a couple of playmakers on there. They had some explosive plays. That guy can distribute the ball to those guys. I think Jordan Travis, you need to find a way to work him into the offense. He's too good an athlete to keep on the bench. I 100% agree with that point. But I, 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 don't, I don't know why it's not clear that you're downfield. The guy who's going to push you downfield and give you a shot is McKenzie Milton. Uh, on top of that, you're Mike Norvell. You had a struggle of a first season at Florida State. 2020, tough situation. Don't really blame Norvell for any of it, quite frankly. Inherited a tough situation there at Florida State. But you could use some good press. This is great press. Milton coming in. The national media had all their stories ready to go the second Milton came in. You hear it? I think I, I think he was called a medical miracle uh, by the broadcasters about seven different times while he was taking snaps. It it's a great story for Florida State. You need the positive PR this year. On top of that, you got a guy who finished uh, it, 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 like he he was a guy that was up for the Heisman at one point, and it's going up against a quarterback that struggles to really push the ball downfield. I don't think this is a question going forward. I hope they don't even have a pretense of a quarterback battle going forward and that we get to see McKenzie Milton play some football in Tallahassee this year. Uh, if you want to talk about the Notre Dame side of things, certainly a step back from what we saw last year with the Irish. Uh, you, we make fun of them with the playoff thing, but they, Notre Dame had a nice season last year. Notre Dame had a nice season, good team. They lost a lot of talent. We saw Jack Cohn step in and play admirably uh, for the Irish, but I, I would think the only thing that, the, that there's many things that they have to work on. I don't think they're, they're going to go home happy with this performance. I, I thought Florida State might put up a little fight with Milton here on, on this Monday or Sunday night game, but I think Notre Dame expected to play a little cleaner than that and certainly blowing that lead late in the fourth quarter raises a lot of eyebrows in South Bend. Uh, almost as many eyebrows that were raised when uh, Brian Kelly executed that joke uh, rather poorly, but I understood it when he was doing it right away. I just, uh, I, I forget I heard say, someone's like, you can't set yourself up for the joke that way. He, he, went, he set, no one set him up. He set himself up. <laughs> so Brian Kelly, sorry, man. Can't sign off on that one. Uh, Monday, September 6th, uh, Louisville, Ole Miss in Atlanta. It wasn't a game. Lane Train stayed at home. Uh, he's positive for COVID. Ends up doing some sideline interviews while he's on Zoom. Uh, it, it doesn't matter. Ole Miss just ran Louisville out of the building with no problem. I, I really expected this to be a high-flying shootout. Louisville ends up putting some points up late to make it look like they were scoring. But they're, they're kind of scored all at once and – uh, Ole Miss really dominated the game from start to finish. The defense was pretty impressive. Uh, a lot of targeting penalties in this game, I, which which really I want to mention the target penalties real quick. Can we please get rid of the ejection? I, I don't think I'm saying anything that most college football fans wouldn't agree with. There, The ejection for targeting, 
The, it just does not fit the crime. It's too heavy of a punishment. It's too much. Like there's too many situations where a defender's going in and, and the quarterback changes his angle at the last second. You saw that in the Penn State Wisconsin game. One of the best defenders for Penn State gets knocked out of the game because the quarterback kind of stops and dips. And same time, Penn State defenders coming in. It, you got to be able to have some realistic expectations with this. I understand the intention of the rule. I think the intention is fantastic, but a 15 yard penalty is enough of a deterrent. There's no defensive coordinator in college football. That's going to be cool. with 15 yard penalties. All right. You might say, well, guys will just, they won't care as much. And they'll, they'll take the penalty. And they'll, they'll hit like, no, trust me. Defensive coordinators will still coach to avoid 15 yard penalties that, that they'll still have their heads protected. If you keep that rule, but the ejection, it's just, it's too far. I'm glad they at least review it. But on the other hand, how much does it slow the game down? I mean, I think they did three reviews for the old Miss game in the first half. And good luck keeping people's attention with that stuff on uh, TV. That's just not, it's not really a good way to do it. Just adopt the NFL rule, move forward. Um, Another note from this game, though, you had suspect performances from a bunch of preseason Heisman candidates, but one of the dark horses who I've loved throughout the offseason, Matt Corral at Ole Miss, the quarterback, he he might be the new Heisman favorite after this week. Throws for 381 yards, rushes for another 55, and this Ole Miss offense is a blast to watch, and I know I will be watching every Rebels game I can this fall. That wraps up week one in review. Let's cut over to Will Turner from Bulls 24-7 for a Florida USF preview. All right, I'd like to welcome in Will Turner of Bulls 24-7 onto the Read and Reaction podcast to preview Florida's trip to Tampa to face the South Florida Bulls. Will, welcome to the show, man. Yeah, I appreciate you having me on. I greatly appreciate it. It uh, should, be, should be a good week. Hey, we're, we're looking forward down to the trip for, for this trip to Tampa here. Uh, that should be a, a fun one for Gator Nation. I'm, I'm sure the Orange and Blue is going to show up there and Raymond James on Saturday. But uh, we want to get a little more educated about what's going on at USF. Uh, I know I know last week was a tough start to the season, but I saw you were up at the game on Thursday night. How was the atmosphere in rally? Oh, it was, it was honestly, it was really good. Uh, I really enjoyed, you know, Carter Finley and, and uh, you know, it's, it's probably one of the more underrated game, game day atmospheres around um, just in terms of, you know, uh, it, it, they, they stocked the, the crowd. It was 52,000 strong, you know, uh, tailgates were rolling. Everything was pretty, was pretty solid. So uh, it was a, it was a pretty cool game environment. I, you know, definitely one that you don't expect. You don't expect Raleigh, North Carolina, to be a maybe a college football hotbed, but but with the state with the state of of how NC State is, and you know, with them potentially being a you know a top twenty team by the end of the year, potentially giving Clemson a run in the ACC. I mean, it's uh, it was it was pretty impressive to see what they have going on up there. Man, so it sounds like you came away pretty impressed from up yeah, there. Yeah, it, it was pretty cool. It was pretty cool. Uh, you know. Just, uh, you know, their game day atmosphere. I mean, they have their their flyover was really, really cool. They've got, you know, four or five planes that are just circling the stadium with uh, smoke going behind them, you know, red, white, and black smoke. And, um, you know, the, the pyro, the from fireworks, flames. I know, you know, it was primetime on, on ACC Network, but it was pretty, it was pretty, pretty neat, especially for that first return to, to a packed house, you know? That, yeah, that that's the real, that was, probably one of the major storylines of week one there with college football, getting those fans going again. So I know I certainly tuned in for the first few drives on Thursday night, but uh, I, I got to go back and watch the game at, in, in whole with the USF game here with NC state, but rough, rough start with the offense in general, right? It was, uh, the, yeah. I, I saw the NC state had some playmakers on the, on the edges. It looked like there was a couple busted coverages there early and it kind of put USF in a hole playing from behind most of the game. Yeah, you know, you go back to the first drive and, and NC State gets a third and eight and it's the first big thir third down of the uh, of the game and you get a tip pass and looks like USF's about to get off the field and, and you know, tip pass ends up going right in the hands of an NC State uh, player. I think Chris Tootle was, was the guy that, that picked it up for them. And um, so they extend the drive there and then Devin Leary, you know, two, two 
Uh, I think the next third down, Devin Leary gets like a third and nine, and USF has great coverage on it, but corner drops down to to go play, you know, to go up and try and make a play on Leary, and he just pops it right over his head for for an easy conversion. You know, if that corner stays in coverage instead of dropping down, you know, until Leary passes the line of scrimmage, I mean, that's that, – that in theory right there should be two ways to get off the field. So, you know, that that's that first drive. I mean, obviously USF had their own issues offensively. You know, Cade Fortin just wasn't really able to – to you know find his receivers to be in time with his receivers all that you know all that stuff that that goes along with being a good quarterback and um you know and then nc state just kind of flexed their muscles and and did uh and did what they do best which is run the football they had two guys over 100 yards uh you know zon of a night ricky person uh counted for 268 yards of of offense between the two of them and Mm. and three three of their touchdowns and then uh jordan houston had another um, so, I mean, they, they did what they do best, which is run the football. And, but that's, you know, what NC state's going to do, uh, to, to anybody they play. And, uh, you know, on the other side, USF doesn't know what they're going to do to beat teams offensively. So, I mean, uh, it was kind of a stark comparison, uh, especially on the offensive side of the ball on, uh, on what they were going to do. Well, it's another reminder that that Jeff Scott's got quite the rebuild ahead of him still yeah. with this roster at USF, where even when they're fully functioning to go into an ACC territory, you better be clicking on all cylinders anyway with that type of roster advantage, typically with the ACC. But let me ask you something here. Quarterback position, Fortin, UNC transfer. Uh, he, he comes down, starts the game. But we saw freshman Timmy McLean come in. And yeah. play for the Bulls. What what do you who do you expect to see starting on Saturday against the Gators? Well, luckily we're not in a position where last year we're asking this question. You know, twenty four hours away from 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 game day. Luckily, we do know who the starter is going to be. It's, it is going to be Fortin again. He's going to get the start, and Timmy McLean is is expected to see a significant amount of time. Um, can Travis Marsh? who's the third string quarterback, who's a true freshman out of Miami, or excuse me, a red shirt freshman out of Miami, uh, could also see some time. Those are kind of the two, two, three major guys. I know a lot of Florida fans might see Jaron Williams on that roster and might go, well, where the heck does Jaron Williams fit in the equation? Um, him and Travis Marsh are listed as oars. Um, but yeah, it's going to be Fortin out of the gate on, uh, on Saturday afternoon. Um, you know, McLean, uh got in after i think four drives and jeff scott basically said he wanted Cade to to sit down and 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 relax and watch and uh you know Cade had the best looking drive of the night uh the final drive of the game where they drive all the way down to the the nc state three or four yard line and they're not able to finish it off and get that touchdown but Mm -hmm. uh but um you know yeah, it, 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 it's it's tough. It you know I was writing some pieces last week about the about the quarterback carousel. I've kind of aptly called this era of quarterback play the merry-go-round era because that's just what it that's just what it's felt like. It's just it's been a constant carousel over the last three seasons and uh, last four seasons, in all honesty. And and uh, you know. Je- there was one quote that really had me scratching my head today that I think, you know, is really, really poignant is uh, Jeff Scott said, quote, we're not playing two quarterbacks because that's the best way to win the football game. We're playing two quarterbacks to figure out who our starter is. So what that tells me right off the rip is that I think they know that they're going to go into that game and they're not. And I, I mean, if that's not a, sign of like we're coming to the game defeated i don't know what the heck is but um you know uh they're they're trying to find their their quarterback obviously they got four non-conference games they got three more to uh between uh florida uh florida AM and uh and byu to figure it out before they start conference play in dallas at, at smu um and that's now where they'd like to see their quarterback situation finally be resolved uh, but yeah, so, so right now, Saturday afternoon, expect Cade Fortin to get the start. And, uh, I don't know how long his leash is going to be. If, if things we're, don't we're still there. searching at that quarterback yeah. position under Jeff Scott. Well, if it makes Jeff Scott feel any better, Florida's going to play a couple of quarterbacks on Saturday too. 
So we, we might they be both able- look better <laughs> against Florida Atlantic than, than the two that USF played did against NC State. I was trying, I was trying to help, man. I'm just trying to help, dude. <laughs> All right, let's talk about I, – I think a lot of people over the last decade here have kind of – UCS been the talk of the country, especially the last five years, and uh, they've put themselves squarely in the middle of that conversation, whether you want to talk about them or not, right? Uh, but the state of the program, really nice early on under Jim Levitt, built up nicely. Obviously, there's controversial exit with Levitt, but he got them up to number two in the country at one point. They had good wins up at Auburn and Tallahassee and everything. And you really thought this program was going in the trajectory. I mean, 10 years ago, you would have thought USF would be where UCF is today. And UCF was the one that was struggling about a decade ago. Right. Uh, I think, though, if you look at the two programs – where a lot of people, maybe in Florida, we know more about them, but nationally, I would think a lot of people think USF, UCF, what's the difference, but they're pretty close They're rival schools. They're probably pretty similar, but financially facilities wise, all the above, it's just been night and day difference over the last several years. And that's where you've seen the growth at UCF and development and I, I want to ask with Jeff Scott coming in here, we'll go over how Jeff Scott got here, but with him coming in here, part of the deal with him coming here seems to have been, hey, we have some facilities that are going to be ready to go and some injection of cash into this program. Is that what you're seeing right now? Yeah, and I mean, that's that's evident in in, in the IPF groundbreaking that's going to take place tomorrow at 11 a.m. and or Wednesday at 11 a.m., depending upon, you know, what time we, this podcast is released. But, uh, yeah, the IPF goes up Wednesday at 11 a.m. or start grounds break, groundbreaking is Wednesday at 11 a.m., they just put the finishing touches on a brand new locker room, brand new players lounge. They've got, you know, a players lounge with, with two PlayStation fives, two Xboxes, brand new lockers, uh, you know, brand new showers, all that stuff. Um, but it's on campus, right. And USF plays 15, 20 minutes down a road at Raymond James stadium. So, um, you know, obviously everybody's, questions go towards an on-campus stadium and that's been you know the questions that everybody's asked for the last you know 15 years at this point it's helped ucf a lot right it has helped ucf a lot absolutely because they can host you know if you if you want to talk about recruits obviously Mm -hmm. you know you don't uh, you know you can host events on that in that you know they host seven on sevens they host uh team camps there they host you know player uh individual one day camps there um USF is able to do that on their practice fields, which is great and all, but at the end of the day, you know, USF still doesn't have a place to, to call their own. And then obviously, you know, with the, from a financial standpoint, right. You still have to pay, you know, Tampa sports authority and you still have to pay, you know, the folks at Raymond James stadium, you still have to, to, to lease that out basically. Um, so you're not making as much cash flow as you could, potentially do it if you had it you know on campus but that step is 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 probably you know still a good you know seven eight years away at this point in my opinion um you know if the administration really wants to get to get cheeky maybe five years um the problem is is that usf is about to go is about to undergo their their second president search in a matter of of shoot 18 18 months, 20 months, if that. Um, the AD's only been there a little over a year, or is he going? He's been second? there. Michael Kelly's been there uh, since 2018. Couple years now. Yeah, so he's been there. I want to say this is this is his fourth fourth year, if I if memory serves, after Mark Harlan left to go to Utah. Mm-hmm. Um, so Michael Kelly's been there, but USF is undergoing, you know, a a, a, a third president and in three years, you know, obviously Judy Genshaft was there and, and, uh, Steve Corral took over, uh, was appointed president, came over from, uh, SMU, SMU sounds right. I'm pretty sure. I don't remember off the top of my head. And, um, and now they're, they've got an interim and, um, now they've got, uh, you know, they're, they're trying to look at, at at what happens down the line and that's going to be huge for, for USF. Uh, obviously if you could get someone that's now going to be aligned with, with athletics and uh, aligned with what uh, align with what the program, you know, ultimately needs, which is, you know, more facilities and more cash flow there. Well, it sounds um, like there's things to do before you get to that stadium step right. anyway. 
and the IPF is and the IPF is a huge piece, right? Mm-hmm. You know, obviously you live in Florida too. It rains every damn day. I mean, it <laughs> it, it during the summertime. So, um, you know, obviously dodging raindrops is one thing, but you could do a lot with an IPF. You could host camps. You could do more, and it just it shows the recruits that you're investing in you're investing in uh in your program which is what recruits want to see so let, let's talk about what the program's been like since since levitt left yeah uh skip holtz comes in has mixed results mostly not great willie tagger comes in struggles finally gets it going has some good recruiting classes along the way there mm-hmm. and then and then uh and then really just uh, obviously takes the Oregon job. We, we know the rest of that history. We just, yeah, he just visited the swamp and we, we said hello to him this past weekend here. Uh, but Charlie strong comes in and that was uh, something that from the outside perception, you thought, okay, the Texas thing didn't work out, but he crushed it at Louisville. We yeah. obviously love Charlie strong at the university of Florida. Right. I thought that was an excellent hire when he came in it just didn't seem like he ever, like he ever was fully connected to that program though. At any point he inherited a great team, Quentin flowers. They went 10 and two that first year he was there. Yeah. And it was just all downhill after that, a lot of negativity around the program. So even though Jeff Scott's been struggling, just the, he he's, brings a different energy that has yeah. been lacking over the last few years. And he's a super positive guy. If you ever follow him on Twitter, he just seems like just puts out that, that, like super positive energy all the time. And yeah, I was just wondering if that's a correct perception there. What did yeah. you see with Charlie Strong? So, you know, the 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 thing with with Charlie is is obviously I think Charlie was ultimately best suited as a as a coordinator. Um, you know, Charlie knows defense is like nobody's business. You know, Charlie was was obviously fantastic at at, at UF and and what he did with with Urban and and winning a a national championship. And, um, you know, I thought, I thought Charlie was a fantastic coordinator and I think he's, he, he's still a fantastic coordinator and position coach in his own right. I mean, that's why, uh, urban took him to Jacksonville with him. I mean, uh, so, uh, Ur- you know, the thing with Charlie is the fact that he never won at a place where he didn't have fantastic quarterback play, right. One as a head coach, Um, you know, Louisville, obviously he had Teddy Bridgewater and Teddy Bridgewater was a fantastic quarterback. That's why Teddy Bridgewater is a starting quarterback in the NFL. You know, Teddy, Teddy was, was nearly revolutionary at the time in some aspects with what he did, you know, obviously, you know, it it kind of set the, the, I don't think Lamar Jackson has a success that he does at Louisville without Teddy Bridgewater having the success at Louisville um that he did but yeah, ultimately Bridgewater definitely took Louisville to the next level right right and I think you know my you know Lamar you know being a Miami kid you know all that good stuff but mm-hmm. um obviously you won that first year with Quentin Flowers again generational quarterback probably the best player in USF per, in USF football history Texas he didn't have great quarterback play and what happened you know um so I think the biggest thing with, with Charlie is just the fact that um you know, he just didn't have, he just didn't have great quarterback play in, in 18 and in 19. And, and, um, you know, obviously Blake Barnett nearly threw for 3000 yards, but, uh, you know, didn't get the the defensive help that he needed or didn't get the wide receiver help that he needed in 19. Um, they tried uh, switching up the staff, you know, they got rid of Ster- Sterling Gilbert, uh, the former offensive coordinator who spent some time over at McNeese state. Now he's at Syracuse. Uh, they got rid of, of uh, a couple other coaches and uh, they brought in Kerwin Bell, who's now the, the head coach mm-hmm. of West, West, Western Carolina, who Gator. Florida fans know very well. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, brought him in, brought his son in, brought a new offensive line coach in from Valdosta State, Jeremy Darvo. Um, Did who else not came? go well. Yeah, a few others came, came, came with, the, with the new staff and, and uh, you know, uh, I, I just, I still think that there were a lot of, you know, bad apples on that team. A lot of, you know, kids that probably didn't need to be on that roster. That's what I was going to ask. Did, yeah. was it, uh, a talent issue where they just weren't recruiting guys or were they missing on guys or bringing in the wrong? Guys? I think they, I think, I think a little bit of both. I mean, they, they, they absolutely missed on some guys, but like they, Barnett's a 
big example yeah. right there. The it, but, yeah. yeah, I mean, without a doubt. I mean, you look at, uh, you know, I'm going back here looking, you know, at the at the 2018 class in particular, you know, the, the third-ranked class in the American Athletic Conference. I mean, you look at, you know, the top couple of guys, Stacey Kirby, defensive end, he's, he's you know, nobody even realizes he's like third on the depth chart these days. He was highest rated recruit. Zion Rowland ended up transferring out from Admiral Farragut. So Dwayne Boyles, you know, your, 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 your third highest rate of crew, you know, you, you, you hit there. Sebastian St. Turling hasn't really done much. Octavius battle transferred out. Um, you know, Jawan Cherry transferred out. Trey Lang transferred out. You did get some good starters out of that 2018 class. Uh, especially along your offensive line with between Brad Cecil and Donovan Jennings starting center and left tackle, left tackle, respectively, Johnny Ford played some good time at USF before transferring to Florida Atlantic. Saw him last week. (laughs) Yeah. Jordan McLeod was your starting quarterback for, for, for a season and a half. Antonio Greer was a fantastic talent in that 2018 class. Um, You know, so that, so that was that. You know, the 19 class, obviously, you know, a lot of those guys didn't really get to play much under Charlie Strong, but you look at the 19 class and you've got, um, you know, MacArthur Burnett's no longer on the roster, former Florida player. Uh, Jacquez Evans is, is no longer on the roster. Darius Williams no longer on the roster. And those are your top three guys right there, right? Uh, you got to go to Daquan Evans, who who actually kind of panned out, you know, to find your first true contributor. Not, not totally uncommon with the coaching change. I mean, we see right. that at other places. Right. So, so the big picture is Jeff Scott has inherited essentially a full scale rebuild at this point of the entire roster. Uh, we saw them go one and nine last year, uh, and and obviously rough opener with NC State here. Tough matchup with Florida Saturday. Are there what silver linings are you taking out of what you've seen so far to show uh, like hopes of optimism for this fan base going, going forward. And where do you see this program three years from now? Is Scott going to get the job done? Is he going to be able to rise up? I mean, I would think in the Tampa, Tampa Bay area with the type of talent you have in the state of Florida, there's no reason why this program shouldn't be a competitor in the American athletic conference year in year out. Yeah, absolutely. You know, if we're talking short term, you know, uh, optimism, I mean, the offensive line played really, really well against NC State. I mean, they, they kept the quarterbacks upright, um, didn't allow a sack. Obviously, this week could change with, you know, Zach Carter being, you know, <laughs> who Zach Carter is and Jervon Dexter or, uh, and, 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 and Desmond Watson and all those I was guys. I say, so. Armwood. You, yeah, you right. Look, I mean, look you, at got, him. you got half of offensive defense, half of Armwood's defensive front. Um, you know, and then a Lake Wales guy and Dexter and a Hillsborough high guy and, and Carter. I mean, like, so yeah, but, uh, you know, offensive line was, was solid. Um, you know, I think, uh, I think the linebackers played, played a lot better, um, you know, than I, than I might've thought. Um, Andrew Mims had 14 tackles, a former walk on Boyles had uh seven Greer had eight, um, excuse me. Boyles did get beat on a wheel route to start the game on that 33 yard touchdown pass, uh, got lost in coverage, but you know, that's, I wouldn't say that's, that's expected. He's a lot better in the pass rush than he is, you know, in coverage. So, um, and, and, you know, he's a veteran guy. He'll correct that. So, but yeah, I mean, in terms of long-term you know, yeah, it, it, it should, with the amount of talent, within you know the bay area you know florida fans know very well how talent rich tampa bay is and and you know polk county is especially and Mm -hmm. hillsborough county especially and um you know florida fans know know how talent rich that area is um but it's time for usf to 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 start and they did it this cycle to start taking some swings at some of those kids that you know florida florida state um, you know, that the big three are going after, especially, you know, uh, and they did it. They, they, they've done it this cycle with with Jalen Glover, who ended up committing to Utah, um, you know, the running back out of Lake Gibson. Yep. Uh, they did it with Greg Gaines, uh, who, you know, was uh, ended up at uh, committing to Iowa State from Tampa Bay Tech. I mean, they, they took some swings on some guys, but eventually they're going to have to land some of those guys to really have a have an impact. And um, it's going to be tough. 
especially this year because USF is only going to have a six to seven person class, right? They brought in a, a lot of transfers uh, over the off season and, you know, they're expecting some uh, attrition, obviously like you will to every year, but uh, you know, it's just, it's, it's tough to, to project where that attrition is going to come. And until then you got to sit and wait in a holding pattern, but uh, yeah, I, you know, it, depending upon where the American athletic conference goes, obviously with, you know, the, the, the talks of big 12 expansion and stuff like that. Um, you know, it, this program should not be where it is within the American, you know, they should be beating teams like temple and East Carolina and um, you know, in, in, in Tulsa when they're, you know, regular Tulsa and they're not, you know, doing what they did last year, they should be beating those type of teams uh, with the talent they've got on that roster. So um, we'll see how it goes. I, I, you know, it's uh, the Florida, Florida game is going to be really going to be a big test. Uh, USF still hasn't scored a point this year. Um, they haven't scored a touchdown uh, against a, a power five opponent since Georgia tech in 2019. Um, so <laughs> you, you got to do something at some point, right? The, the levy's got to break at some point. So we'll see, we'll see what Saturday brings. Uh, Grantham will dial up a blitz for you guys at some point. You guys, you guys will sneak one in there at some point there. But to, to, to your point, the transfers on the roster, 28 yeah. guys are transferred, have played at other schools. That includes community colleges, uh, yeah. JUCOs. Uh, 12 have power five experience. So there, there is, there is, there is some talent on this roster, albeit it's new to the system. Coaches are still getting to know the players, obviously too. You see a lot of the – how many first-year coaches had a great year in 2020? Not that was many. just a rough year to have a coaching right. transition to where you couldn't get in and really work on changing the culture. You, t- you hear that all the time with new coaching staff, so we need to change the culture. Uh, you know, maybe outside of Lane Kiffin where the there was already a lot of talent on that offense, so that's about it. But, um, yeah, for a complete rebuild, this is just something where – I think USF fans, you guys are, are, are kind of in, in it for the long haul here. But how are you feeling about your chances Saturday? And, and what matchups do you like for USF on Saturday? Is there, is there any that stand out to you that you go like, I don't think we're going to be completely overwhelmed in this area or that area? I think the most entertaining matchup of the day, in my opinion, is is going to be Zach Carter against Donovan Jennings or uh, right tackle Demontre Jacobs. I mean, I think I think, uh, um, I think especially when he's lined up against Jennings. I mean, that's Tampa, that's Tampa's best on, on Tampa's best. I mean, um, that's probably going to be the most entertaining matchup of the day in my mind. Um, you know, I think, uh, I think the offensive line against the defensive line is going to be something to watch uh, specifically just because, you know, Florida's defensive line is, is, is monstrous as I already, you know, alluded to and USF's offensive line has been better. Um, you know, I'm intrigued to see, uh, I'm intrigued to see, USF's defensive line against Florida's offensive line as well. You know, Florida, uh, you know, USF's defensive line um, ha- has had some struggles. You know, they're, they're, they're undersized. I mean, if you look at the depth chart, you know, second on the D tackle spot is a 6'2", 232 freshman. I mean, you know, 232 pounds of defensive tackle is, is not, <laughs> is not going to cut it. Um, no. So, you know, I'm intrigued to see, how, you know, I think this game's going to be as cliche as it's going to sound. It's going to be one in the trenches. I mean, it, it really is. I mean, Florida ran for 400 yards last week and Malik Davis had a great game, which was awesome to see, uh, you know, after the injuries that he suffered. And, but on the flip side, USF rushed for 104 and, you know, they, they had – Three guys, nobody nobody had above 26 yards. I mean, Jaron Mangum, the Colorado transfer, had 26. Fortin had 23. Darian Felix had 21, and 16 of those came on a first play of the game. Mm-hmm. Um, Kelly Joyner had 19, and Brian Petit, uh didn't register, uh, at least on this box, box score I'm looking at right now. But, uh, you know, Brian Petit and Kelly Joyner were your leading rushers last year for USF. Well, excuse me. Leading rushers in each of the last two years, it was Batia in 20 and Joyner in 19. And Joyner got maybe a Joyner got 11 snaps, Batia got eight. 
and over, you know, the two transfers and Felix and, and, and Mangum. And I kind of had me scratching my head. Like I know NC state had really good linebackers, but at a point, like you gotta go back to what worked in, in the last two years that the two guys you brought in aren't working. So, um, I'd be intrigued to see if they get some more run this week. Um, you know, but yeah, I think this game is, is going to be one between, between the tackles and, and between both running games. Cause I know Florida's obviously got, you know, a lot to figure out between Emory and, in in AR 15. And I know, uh, especially, you know, those two guys are going to hurt you with their legs more than they're going to hurt you with their arms. So. Well, that's uh, actually a big question. Florida fans, uh, have come into this game cause we got Alabama yeah. coming to the swamp next week. Right. So that's the one everyone's getting worked up over right now. Uh, and that's, and that's kind of what I said, right. Was w- w- what I, what I've said is, is if this is a week that Florida wants to, to figure out their quarterback situation, this is the week to do it. I mean, USF has allowed 40 points in each of their last three games dating back to, to, to last season, you know, they've, they've how, how's that secondary looking though? That's a, cause I, I, I'm curious to see what the, if it's if looking Mullen a lot thinner. It. It's yeah. looking a lot thinner than, than it should be. Right. So um, this should be a secondary that a, a decent passing game will expose. Right. Christian Williams, uh, the Miami transfer, is going to be out for a significant amount of time with a high ankle sprain. Uh, will Jones, who was supposed to be starting safety from Kansas State, um, ended up with an ACL tear, so he's out for the year. Um, you know, so so they brought in three big transfers in the defense uh, 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 for the defense back department and two of them are, are, are gone uh, and, and injured. So, um, you know, TJ, right. So, um, you know, Devin Leary was 17 to 26 for 232 and a pair of scores, uh, you know, last week uh, for NC state against that, that defense and that defensive end, uh, defensive back uh, spot. I thought they played okay um, at times, you know, uh, there's just going to be more shuffling. I think the Auburn transfer, Matthew Hill, is going to play a big part this week. I think uh, the Rutgers transfer, TJ Robinson, is going to end up playing a big part this week just because of the, the injuries around. Um, you know, and then there's going to be guys that guys that are going to have to step up. Will a, will a guy like Jaden Curry, who's listed as a backup free safety, who's been on this roster for now three years, will he step up and finally make a play? Will he step up? Will – you know, a guy will, will a true freshman like a Jalen Herring or, um, you know, a Jalen Stokes or, um, you know, Gabe Neely or somebody, you know, these guys that USF brought in, are those guys ready to start making some plays? Because with the, the thinning out already on the back end, they're going to have to do it. I mean, somebody's going to have to do it or else they're going to give up, you know, 40, 50 points a, a, a game all season. Good opportunity this weekend for that Florida passing game. You heard it here. Uh, <laughs> USF coming to the swamp next year too. So hopefully uh, Scott will have another year of development within that program. Uh, yeah. This year we're sitting at a 28 point spread though. Uh, will, how you feeling about the game? How you feel about keep, that? Give yeah, me all these, all the y'all in NC state are alike, man. Y'all making me make predictions on the fly. Um, Real quick though. To, That's the to, most fun part about this. Come right. On. Real, uh, real quick, just to speak to your last point about, you know, Scott potentially getting another year. And, and I think, and I think he ultimately does. I don't think there's a whole lot of, a, a whole lot of, of, of pressure in terms of a hot seat right now for Jeff Scott. I don't oh, that would be crazy if there was. Yeah. I don't, I don't think there is. I think USF fans, it was, you know, there's been some talking on Twitter, obviously, but it's Twitter. So, yeah, that's um, you know, USF fans are obviously unhappy of the early start, but um, you know, I don't think he's on a hot seat right now. I don't think there's a whole lot of pressure. I think the uh, administration knows that last year was tough and and, and stuff like that. But um, maybe some staff changes at the end of the year. But again, it's game one. We don't know what the hell's going to happen. So um, prediction, Jesus. Um, shoot. For, for the record, FAU covered 23 and a half last oh, week. Oh, did they? <laughs> yeah, they, they just got that late touchdown. Florida has been a big fan of giving up on these big spreads. They've been a fan of giving up these late touchdowns that screw some betters out who like the Gators. But, you know, I, I think this is what the Gators got a good shot at covering. I, I, I think even with the 28, I wish it was 27. You might want to buy a half point there. You might want to buy that half point. Yeah, you know, I'll tell you right now. Um, people were telling me to take to, to, you know, people thought NC State was, was going to cover 
you know, 17 last week. And I was like, look, I was like, NC State is going to be U.S. up a lot more than 17 if it gets bad early. Um, it's going to be a Florida home game. I think we I think we could safely say that. I think there's mm-hmm. going to be a lot more orange and blue in the stands than, than green and gold. I know USF, I've seen a lot of USF fans already try and sell their tickets for this week. Um, so it's going to be a Florida home game. It's on ABC, 1 o'clock. Ray J is going to be hot. It's going to be sticky. Um, We're used to that. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, we are too. So um, I think uh, – you know, until USF gives up anything south of 45, um, you know, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I'm thinking 40, you know, 40 to 45, 40 to 50 points for, for Florida to put up. And mm-hmm. I'm thinking maybe, maybe 49 to 14 is, co- is kind of what I'm looking at. Um, you know, obviously, I know Florida, you know, just kind of looking at their last couple of scores, you know, obviously, you know, going back to the last five games is not maybe the greatest comparison just because of, you know, you're looking at the OU and the Alabama game and the LSU game from last year. But I know Florida can can let up on the gas a little bit more than some other teams do. Um, but it's an in-state rival. I mean, you know. Um, Dan Mullen had Richardson throwing deep balls on the final drive of the game. I, I know that's why I'm like <laughs> that's why I'm saying 49 to 14 because I, I I just I don't I don't think I don't think they'll let off the gas uh, in this one, especially with uh, with Alabama coming. I think they want to make a statement ahead of that Alabama game. Well, we're, I mean, I'm definitely looking forward to the game on Saturday here. Uh, obviously, we're not we're not catching our in-state brethren here at their best moment at, with South Florida football, but I I really do. In terms of Jeff Scott, where's your faith in him right now? Do you, do you think that he's going to be the guy that gets the job done and turn this around? Because I, I I think he's got serious potential. Uh, the jury is still out. Uh, yeah. The jury is still out at this point in time. Um, you know, they're, they're moving the right direction in terms of culture. Uh, you know, guys are, are, are doing more in the locker room. They're, you know, picking up trash for other guys, you know, they're keeping the, they're keeping their stuff nice. And, and there's momentum, excuse me, there's momentum in terms of the facilities that are being built, which is awesome. But in terms of an on-field product, it's just, it's just not there yet. And, and, um, you you continue to to fail to stabilize a quarterback situation that's been just going around in circles for the last four years now. Um, so the on field product is 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 still a little shaky, and that's why the jury's still out, in my opinion. But uh, culture wise, I think I think they're moving in the right direction. I think uh, you know they're they're doing some good things with the facilities. I think you know all that all that stuff will will help the on field product, but. Um, until until we start seeing significant improvement in the on field product, um, it's just it's just hard to say right now. And what's, what's your expectations for this season? You thinking bowl game? I know obviously NC State and Florida is a pretty brutal way to open the season for a team that's still on the on the climb here. But yeah, are we think, are we feeling like we got a shot at a bowl game this year? I, I I'm not I'm not thinking that. I think four wins was kind of the 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 base that a lot of USF fans had. I think that's kind of what I was looking at myself as well, you know, turning back my game notes to the schedule here. Uh, you know, obviously I think a lot of USF fans were, were realizing that uh, they were going to come out of the September month at, at, at one and one and three, you know, lose to NC state, lose to Florida, mm-hmm. lose to BYU in two weeks, um, beat Florida AM. and um, And then, you know, you go on the road, you play a tough SMU team with, with Trent Mordecai, who just threw seven touchdown passes against Abilene Christian. Um, Tulsa looks like they're going to be down this year. That game's at home. Who did they just lose to? UC Davis. UC Davis, 17-14, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, was... some, or 19-17, something like that. Something yeah. So Tulsa looks like it could be down. So Tulsa could – so that's kind of a toss-up. They should beat Temple. Um East Carolina on the road concerns me, but East Carolina didn't look that great at Appalachian State. Um, Houston's a toss-up. Who knows what that team's going to look like? Um, obviously, you're losing to Cincinnati. Tulane put up much more of a of, of a fight against Oklahoma wow. than a lot of people thought. I mean, good. they they had a chance to win that ball game, and then uh, you know UCF is who knows what the heck UCF That's- is going to do right now with, with you know especially especially uh, you know. 
at the it's end of the year, number. you must have made that game tight late. So, um, I yeah, think, y'all did play him well last year. It, yeah, without a doubt, it was fifty-eight to forty-six. So uh-huh. you must have made it tight late. So I'm thinking four wins. I'm thinking Florida A and M, uh, maybe Tulsa, maybe Temple. Uh, maybe Houston, maybe East Carolina. Um, I think there's, you know, there's, there's a way after seeing that first week, it's a little bit easier to see the way to four wins than, than, than after the season or or than before the season, kind of seeing how Tulsa was kind of seeing how Temple was, um, you know, kind of seeing how ECU and Houston were. So, um, there's still a, a, a pack to four wins. Uh, but that, yeah, I think that would be improvement in, uh, in, in, in a lot of USF fans' mind. Baby steps. I know football fans in general are not uh, uh, inclined to, to hear that, but progress right. is progress. You got you to take it a little bit at a time sometimes. And, yeah. hey, Will, where can people find you? Yeah, so uh, my personal Twitter is at WTurner247. Uh, we, it's where I post a lot of my, my, my thoughts during the week and, and a lot of, you know, uh, live presser comments. We'll talk to Charlie Weiss, Jr. and Glenn Spencer, offensive defensive coordinator tomorrow. We'll have the IPF groundbreaking coverage tomorrow. Um, and then Thursday, uh, we'll, we'll talk to Jeff Scott one more time. Our site Twitter is at bulls 24 seven. Uh, all the latest stories that get posted on the website go there. And then, uh, the, the main site, and our message boards are bulls247.com. Um, feel free to, if, if you've got a 24-7 account, feel free to, to jump in. We'd be happy to have you join the conversation this week. All right. Florida USF, 1 p.m. on Saturday at Raymond James Stadium, uh, airing on ABC, I believe. Yep. Bill, thanks again for joining us, man. This was great. Absolutely. Appreciate you having me, Nick. Have a good one. All right, for our next segment here, I'd like to welcome Ryan Winter of Sports Chat 503. Great YouTube channel, if you can't tell by his background, dedicated to the Oregon Ducks. I mean, this guy has a passion and energy for Oregon football. Did an interview with him in the spring where we got the whole rundown on the American Football Stories podcast about the history of the Oregon program. Fascinating stuff, if that interests you. Uh, That's also up on YouTube here. But we're going to keep it simple tonight on the Read Reaction podcast. Uh, Ryan, let's start with looking at the Ducks only as they head east to face the Ohio State Buckeyes in Columbus. How are we feeling after that week one nail biter against Fresno State and Austin Stadium? Uh, not ideal. You know, I don't know if that was exactly the start you wanted. The number one guy on the team gets hurt rolled up on that's not what you want to see uh came on Thibodeau doesn't finish the game potential number uh, one and, draft pick next yeah, next spring yeah yep. yeah I mean I mean when, when, let's keep it real when would Oregon be able to go to Ohio State and possibly have the best player on the field that, that, that that's rarely ever going to happen right so here it is and he gets rolled up on a sprained ankle anybody who's played any sport knows sprained ankles are brutal they can take absolutely weeks or weeks or weeks or he could be ready tomorrow So it's tough to say. They're going to keep it very close to the vest, but expect him to play. It's just maybe not exactly what you wanted off the edge. As soon as he left the game, Oregon's defense was in trouble. It felt like the the next play also we had a linebacker hurt. So Mm. it was was a dicey situation. But, you know, uh, going into week one, we expected some pretty good things out of the Pac-12 and did not really see him outside of UCLA. Uh, and so uh, we're feeling the, the pressure right now. I think this weekend's going to be crazy. I mean, we're going to have the Ducks going to Columbus. We're going to have the Huskies going to Ann Arbor. And we're going to have a and come out to Colorado and play this week. There's, there's some big games on the schedule this week now. Hey, and is, Oregon play, yeah. play, play an A&M, is that a violation of the alliance? <laughs> no, I don't know I, the rules I, yet. I don't know the alliance rules I don't know the rules yet. either. Nothing was written down. So <laughs> I, I don't <laughs> – I don't know. I mean, I think I think we want to play the SEC as a pack. I think everybody wants to play the SEC. Uh, but yeah, the Alliance that I'll could be another. Uh, we 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 can talk about that for days. But ACC didn't look very good in their first week either. So, but you know, going back to Oregon, you know, the the defense sets the tone. If the defense can play well, the Ducks are in this. Historically, the Ducks have always had a good offense. We do have some questions marks about the offense, though. People are questioning the quarterback right now. Mm-hmm. They love to do that. They, they just didn't look that sharp. Fresno State, I think, is a pretty good team, but they're not on any level comparatively to the, what we're going to see the rest of the year. And so it was a, it was a little dicey. 
Well, let's talk about that quarterback position. You got Anthony Brown, who's a graduate transfer from Boston College, came over last year during the COVID year, started plenty at Boston College, very experienced quarterback. I was actually pretty shocked when he picked Oregon because uh, you felt like he'd probably want to go somewhere where he could play more. Didn't play much last year, but you saw him a little bit later in the season. But now he steps in, and, and he's that steady starter as they're trying to groom freshmen uh, – Pretty big, pro, high-profile recruit there, Ty Thompson, right? I mean, I, I think he got a lot of attention in the offseason. Uh, where, where do you expect? Like, how, how how long is Brown's leash at this point going into the Ohio State game? And if it's not pretty early on, do you expect Thompson to get a shot against the Buckeyes? I, I don't see the freshman coming in. I, I think they could be down by two or three touchdowns. I don't think they feed him to the Wolves. I think if it happens and, the, and Brown uh, uh, gets pulled at some point during the year, we're in catastrophic mode. I think uh, at that point, uh, all bets are off. I do think uh, Anthony Brown is a serviceable quarterback. He's a game manager. Okay, you would, If that could be an insult to quarterbacks, that's fine, but he's, he's, he's of that ilk. And He's very incredibly calm and cool in the pocket. The guy almost takes too long. And he is uh, a, a pretty chill demeanor. So I think he's seen a lot of football. Like you said, he played a lot of football at Boston College. Mm -hmm. Played pretty good football, threw the deep ball, had both knees redone. So there were questions about his knees. Uh, but yeah, he chose Oregon, which was interesting because there was an opening technically when Herbert left. But there was the incumbent that everybody thought was going to be the starter, who he was, Tyler Shuck, who is now going to going to, I think, have a pretty good year at Texas Tech. So, um, you know, Oregon quarterback situation is weird. Uh, if, if if you don't have this, and it's like this everywhere with transfer portal. If you don't have that starter position, you're you're either going to stay or you're going to transfer. There's either one or two options. I think they're fearful that some of these younger kids might pull the trigger and transfer, especially if they go right to the freshman and they skip over those two sophomores. They could lose Brown by not having the starter. They could lose both sophomores by transferring, and then they have to go with the freshman, and then they have walk-ons behind him. So it could be interesting for them. I do think Anthony Brown's going to play fairly decent this week. He can move with his legs a little bit. He can get you first downs. He's not going to panic. This is going to be a huge environment. He's not going to be overwhelmed. And I think those are the key things that he needs to be uh, to be successful. More importantly, I think he just needs to get the ball out of his hands faster. I think the guy just waits a little long. Sometimes he throws that intermediate route behind the guy. I think he just needs to get the ball going faster. So do you anticipate a lot, a lot of short passes against the Buckeyes here? He's he's not the type of guy who's going to attack downfield too too deep, right? He's not. No, the, you worry about the accuracy a little bit downfield with him. I, I I actually think he throws the deep ball more accurate than he throws the intermediate pass. I just think that Ohio State's got question marks on the corners because those guys were injured. Those guys mm -hmm. didn't play last week. And, you know, Ohio State's corners are NFL corners. So, I mean, you're talking about they're the next ones going to the pros. Right. So they're some of the best in the country. And not having them in that game last week was kind of interesting. And I think they're also their safety was out last week as well. So they've got some question marks coming back how the healthy those guys are going to be. But even their backups are going to be fine. I just – I tend to think that in the middle, you're going to have to pick apart the defense somewhere. You're going to have to find spots. And uh, I think Ohio State's defense – could be their question mark comparatively to their offense, but I still don't think it's that much of a question mark. I think Ohio State's got a pretty stout defense, and Oregon's going to have some trouble running the ball against them, so they better be able to pass. Well, we saw Minnesota run the ball pretty effectively against that Buckeye defense. Of course, kind of changed. Like you talk about just like Thibodeau went down, that defense suffered when Ibrahim uh, went down from Minnesota. That Buckeye uh, defense was able to stop that run a little more effectively. Maybe they are just facing a great back, but he was certainly having some openings to run through that I think this Oregon team is absolutely capable of exposing. We've seen uh, Mario Cristobal change the profile of this program and really bring that more uh, that SEC type of mentality that they talk about a lot after his time in Alabama uh, with up on the offensive line that you I don't see a lot of other Pac-12 programs between that and the recruiting that he's done out there. Do you, do you anticipate this Oregon team with Brown's running ability to be able to have a little bit of success early on running the ball? I do. I mean, I, I think this is the time to do it. I mean, again, like yeah. you just said, you, you laid it all out there. They're recruiting. The expectations go up. We've never recruited like this and you never stacked three or four recruiting classes together. And you've never had the recruiting classes actually able to gel and mature on staff like they have right now. They've had that. Um, they're coming off two uh, Pac-12 championships, back-to-back, -back, okay? Uh, they, they've had they've had guys going to the pros. They've had that. Now you're checking off a lot of boxes here. Now it's time to win one of these games. you got to mm -hmm. cash one of these in. 
And until they do, I think there's going to be a huge stigma. Um, you know, I do think that, like you said, about the uh, offensive line getting bigger, the defensive line getting better, more committed to the strength and conditioning, and 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 being just beefier up front is going to help them in a game like this. Um, their talent level right now, 2021, is closer to match Ohio State than it's ever been. Um, it's just whether or not now we can get the coaching staff to actually call the right game and uh, see if we can actually score some of these points. That was such a bummer that, that y'all lost that home game with the Buckeyes last year. I mean, even though that Buckeye team last year is pretty solid, uh, that would have been nice to see that Scarlet and Gray, Gray travel out to Autzen Stadium and, and play. You guys get that home field advantage. Uh, like, get, give people an idea of what it's like in Autzen Stadium just so they understand how good the home field advantage is for the Ducks. You know, I think it's at, I think it's on par with a lot of the bigger. You know, it's only sixty thousand, but I think it's on par with some of the bigger uh, uh, stadiums around. I've, I have a friend of mine who's a great uh, uh, follow on Instagram. It's uh, NCAA is my religion. My man is a incredible fan. He'll go to like thirty, almost forty games a year. He'll go to two or three games on a weekend. He's one of these guys. And he's in the Midwest, and he's seen all the Big Ten stadiums. He goes to the SEC. He's seen all these things. And he went to Oregon as a graduate student, and he says Autzen is just as loud as any of them. I do think, though, that there's something to be said about the character that is Oregon football. Like we said in your previous podcast, Oregon football does not have a lot of success in the past, up until about the 90s when we start getting respectable. So there's kind of a little bit of an underdog feel with Oregon, and they kind of bring that to the stadium. Now, there's a whole new crop of fans that is – Chip Kelly or post Chip Kelly, where they expect greatness, but I, I do think Autzen Stadium is a very unique thing. It's a bowl. It's a full bowl. There's no out, no way uh, on the sideline you can get in. It's absolutely tucked in, so it does contain the sound pretty well. Um, and there's a great vibe at Autzen. I mean, we've got great craft beer out here. It's a great, it's a great place to live. Oregon, we do we do it pretty well out here, Pacific Northwest. Uh, it, it's beautiful, beautiful area, and and they represent well. The home game last year would have been huge, and even if you didn't have COVID. Last year, during that week, we had the worst wildfires we've seen in absolute years. It would have got canceled from the smoke. Mm. I mean, I'm telling you, there was something against that game. And so, uh, but that would have been a huge game, especially because the team Oregon had last year. They had a lot of NFL guys on that defense that were, were ready to go that actually opted out, didn't even play last year because they got ready for the NFL draft. And then they had Penny Sewell, uh, the tackle, who was, you know, all everything for us there. And so there were some good matchups to be looked at in that game. Still, I don't know if Oregon gets that win, but they at least have the talent on the field to be able to compete. I wanted to paint that picture of Austin Stadium, which you did a great job of there, Ryan, because Ohio State is almost uh, – well, Austin's what? What's the capacity of Austin? 60. 60. 60 yeah, Ohio State's 100. And you talk about – it's so much more spread out, whereas you talk about in Gainesville for the Florida field, it, you're right on top of that stadium just like you see on TV at Austin. So that sound really magnifies – but Ohio Stadium is built. You talk about like one of the cathedrals of college football. It's very spread out, very spacious. It can get loud with 100,000 people, sure. But it's a completely different feel than those guys can be used to in Austin. And I, I think it'll be interesting to see how they handle that coming out the gate. Uh, but, uh, you know, obviously Oregon, big-time program, big-time player. It's not going to be an issue. But it'll, it'll, I'm just, just curious to see. I think it'll be a very different feel. They certainly handled it okay going in when they go down – to the LA Coliseum. That's usually not a huge issue for those guys. Well, they play the Rose Bowl. Is, yeah. Well, only problem is LA Coliseum is about 35,000 ducks and about maybe 10,000 <laughs> SC fans. So uh, not quite the same atmosphere, not the same passion, seats. not the same passion no, there. No. Yeah. Well, okay. Let's go. Let's flip over. We talked about the offense. Let's go over the defense here. First and foremost, you mentioned that the ankle sprain with Thibodeau, some uncertainty with his status. You're confident he's at least going to play, though, right? I mean, probably. I mean, yeah. the way he got rolled up on shot. didn't – Yeah, I mean, it did – it looked – I mean, it looked dangerous, you know. It could have been bad, but he came back out and played during that game. Then he went back out and put on the boot. So, yeah, I, I think he'll be fine. I think – but I just don't know how explosive. Again, his whole thing is speed, right? So, mm -hmm. I mean, you're taking an ankle away from him, and he's not a power guy. So, um, I do think the way that the offense is set up for uh, – the Buckeyes, they'll be able to be fine. They'll go the other way on it. They'll put a double team on him, whatever. They'll figure a way out. 
I think their offense is one of the best in the country. I, I, I think that these guys, the wide receiver core, I think, is the best wide receiver core in the country. And I think their offensive line is the best off, uh, offensive line in the country, or at least contends for it. So those two are pretty good. You can put dang near anybody back there, you know, and they have great talent at quarterback. But you can put pretty much anybody back behind that line with that running game, with those wide receivers, and at least move the chains. So uh, I, I do think that its matchup is good on good with offense and defense against Oregon. And then you have maybe a little bit lackluster when you have Oregon. Oregon's offense going up against their defense. I know Thibodeau gets a lot of the attention, but for, for those that don't follow Oregon too closely, they have a great set of young linebackers. I mean, the first couple of years, these guys are first couple of years in the program, and they're already making quite an impression out in, at, in Eugene. Give us, give us your thoughts on uh, the linebacker court. Well, the linebacker core, first of all, you have to go back to that recruiting. As recruiters, as we saw, they were the number one, number two linebackers in the country when they're coming out of high school. And they both chose here West Coast kids. It could be just West Coast linebackers, but they were on major uh, recruiting boards, right? Noah Sewell, we know about his brother. We know about his whole family. Every single one of his brothers played D1 football. This is the youngest of them all. So imagine him in the backyard playing with these guys out. On the t- by their backyard with sand and, and uh, you know, American Samoa. But the <laughs> idea is, imagine him being the guy it, it, as, as the youngest brother running away from all those guys or playing the quarterback position or running the ball which is what he did in high school guy's an incredible athlete i think he's the best player on the entire football team at oregon because he could probably play any position so he's the guy to watch for he's the he was basically a starting middle linebacker as a true freshman making the calls i mean he pushed isaac slade montatia away uh, to the will backer and then he he then actually transferred to smu and and he was the starting middle linebacker before and pretty good Mm. So Noah Sewell's legit. Justin Flo is apex predator. This guy is apex predator. I love it. <laughs> I I don't know how this guy is this juiced. I mean, this guy is unhinged, and he gets hurt last year, and I think that could have been the best thing for him. I think um, not to have a, a bad knee, but I think to just sit back for a second, to just hit the weight room, to watch the field, because this guy was so gung ho, so hundred and ten percent that I think it's important for him to kind of see how the game plays out a little bit at the next level. Um, but this this dude's apex predator. I mean, his first game, he's got 14 tackles. He's got a, a forced fumble. He's got probably five unassisted tackles. He's everywhere on the field. Uh, yes, there were times where maybe he was getting burned a little bit uh, in pass protection or something, but this guy fills an A-gap like nobody's business. And he actually moved into that middle backer position as well when Drew Mathis went out. So he's playing the will, but then he slips over. So very versatile. And these guys are both very young. With this COVID situation last year, these guys are basically still freshmen, the way they count it so uh those guys are legit um and then on the edge i think mace funa is a guy to really watch for uh he's number 47 on the other side of kt but this is a guy who's legit as well and so they've got a lot of really good linebackers and then they had tim deruder defensive coordinator from cal who's kind of known for being creative with the defensive linebackers and those linebackers can play a variety of positions we saw it already with kt the fact that he's basically playing an outside backer position rather than a dn he's on two feet uh, he can go back. He was in pass coverage a couple times. So they're doing a lot of creative stuff there. So they have one, the talent, and then now we're going to see how they do with the X's and O's. So a lot of physical guys, great athletes. That's the type of linebacker core you need to keep up with that, that Buckeye offense. Uh, maybe one area of concern, though, is the secondary. Fresno goes off for 300 yards, in part because the Ducks did seem to focus on shutting down that running game last last week. But – I saw. I know C.J. Stroud struggled at times for the Buckeyes, the new quarterback for the Buckeyes against Minnesota. You could say it was in the rain. You could say it was a road game. He was over, definitely overthrowing guys. Looked like he was having trouble handling the football a little bit. Uh, I, I I look at that though and say it's also a young quarterback making his first start. He's allowed to make a few mistakes, right? But he did have some very good throws to some wide open receivers, Chris Olave, Garrett Wilson, two of the best in the country going to go high in the NFL draft this, this year. How are we feeling about that? How that Ducks secondary is going to hold up against the Bucks? Well, two guys that have come back are the two guys that got suspended earlier in the summer. So we had an incident where these guys were off doing stupid stuff and uh, they get busted. They get the first game uh, that they're out. That's Jamal Hill and DJ James. Uh, DJ James was in line to be the starting corner. Jamal Hill was in, in line to be the starting safety. Oh, Both man. those guys were out the first game. They're now back. They won't start, but they'll play. Uh, that should help a little bit. 
I just think they were given way too much cushion on the edge. I, I do think that this Cristobal team, if I could give one real detriment, it feels like they play down to their competition. And I feel like they're going to play up to their competition in the Ohio State game, and you're going to see a great game. I mean, last year we saw it. We saw them lose to Oregon State and lose to Cal, and then we saw them beat USC. Those are two completely different games, right? So I think that's going to be the case here. Um, not to say that they have the vanilla playbook. I think they play the same playbook every, every week. That doesn't matter. But I do think that you're going to see a little bit better uh, defense, at least a little bit tighter coverage. I think both those guys, uh, Wilson and Olave, both those guys are some of the best yards after catch guys too. Mm -hmm. They seem to bounce as soon as they get that ball. And that's the real danger for us is, is, is we constantly have the middle open. The Ducks are constantly leaving the middle open. And, 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 and I guess it's the zone complex uh, 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 consistency of the zone to be able to actually have guys up on the line. I mean, I couldn't tell you how many times I saw it in the Fresno game and in the past where the, these guys need eight yards for a first down and the quarterback's 16, 15 yards from them. I mean, why wouldn't you play the line? We teach it in basketball, like, don't go past the three-point line. Don't give the guy the line. And I don't understand why they wouldn't do that in football as well so uh it's going to be interesting i do think that uh, ohio state needs to throw the ball to win i don't know if they can just run the ball like they did uh, in years past ezekiel elliott or whatever in, the, in that championship game where it felt like they weren't going to the pass they were just going to run it down your throat and see if you could stop them he was just I something think that, else during that stretch though 100 <laughs> percent. yeah i mean he goes to be the rookie of the year the ducks didn't have that great a, uh, of luck we played cam newton in the one game who was the rookie of the year the next year in the <laughs> nfl and then you go play zeke elliott as a rookie of the year these guys are nflers as yeah. you know call it these best players in the country but I do think that the Ducks are going to have a chance to to try to contain the run a little bit and force them to pass, and that could be a good thing. That could be a bad thing. So we're just going to have to see. I think I think the offensive line for Ohio State so good that I don't see Oregon get a tremendous amount of pressure. Um, I don't even know if it matters to get a tremendous amount of pressure because C.J. Stroud can move a little bit. And but I do think that there's going to be some opportunities for a turnover or two, and I think that's the difference. If Oregon has a shot in this game, I think they have to win the turnover battle, maybe by two. So how how are you feeling overall about the Ducks' chances heading out here in, into Columbus? I know you're saying they got to win the turnover battle. Obviously, we feel like Oregon's the team that's got it. They got it. They definitely got to bring their A game, play a little cleaner than they did against Fresno here. But if the Buckeyes don't show up with their best stuff, Oregon comes out with something good. I don't. I don't think it would shock anyone to see an upset in terms of talent level here. It's not that the gap's not that crazy. But what do you got to do to avoid the blowout and contend in this game? Right. So that, that's the main thing. I think they have to move the chains offensively, so the Ducks have to get first downs. You know, I think uh, when, when it comes to this offense, it gets a little bit stale at times, and it feels like there's not a consistency. We know you're going to move the chains on this next play. Um, you could get a great first down, eight yards, and all of a sudden stale out for two plays and you're punting. So I, I, I think they just need to be very consistent offensively. Um, they need to take some shots. They need to be able – they can't play at vanilla. They cannot just line up and play the game against these guys. They're going to have to somehow catch a break offensively. Maybe it's a special teams play that they pick up big yardage on or maybe even a touchdown or it's a turnover. I don't think you can win it straight up. And I think they're probably down by two touchdowns. Down. So so you think, uh, you think Ohio State's going to win this game by two touchdowns? I do unless something happens, you know, unless we get some sort of thing. I mean – Oh, let's do the Fresno game, for example, right? Yeah. The Fresno game, you had two turnovers in the first quarter that goes to 14 points. The Ducks go up 14-0. They get another uh, uh, touchdown. Fresno State rolls off 18 points and goes ahead. Okay, that's Fresno State. If they don't have those turnovers earlier in the game, they could have won by 20. So it, it, it could get bad fast. If, we're, if the Ducks aren't careful, it could get real bad. I think the Ducks have to stay in it. First couple, three quarters, if you can go into the fourth quarter late, you maybe got a chance. But I, I'm not trying to be like a negative uh, thought process here. I think the Ducks have a chance to go to the Rose Bowl this year. But I don't I don't know if anybody beats Ohio State <laughs> this year. Ohio State's a great team. I mean, maybe in the playoffs when they're up against Alabama, it feels like Alabama's head and shoulders above everybody else. But if you were to give me a 14 playoff right now I, I, with Georgia, with, Al, with Alabama, with Ohio State, I like Ohio State to go to the championship game. Well, I I'll say this. Certainly, certainly the Buckeyes, I think they're expecting to take care of business at home. Oregon has the talent to, to give them a run. But let's say that two touchdown prediction comes true. And it's more like the type of game 
where Ohio State needs to put it away in the fourth quarter, right? Not where Ohio State's up by four touchdowns, gives up two touchdowns later, where it's been a total blowout the whole day. But it's like the type of game where Ohio State has to close it out late and ends up winning by two touchdowns. I think in the event of that case there, does Oregon still have a, a path to the playoff down the road? Because I think I think most people are expecting the Ducks to contend. You, like you said, the Rose Bowl, the Pac-12 is definitely the goal. I mean, you've done it the last two seasons. Last year was really weird with that Washington situation where Washington couldn't field the team. Uh, even though they had the better record, they couldn't field the team for Pac-12 title game either. So you guys ended up representing the North, going down, dominating USC, and really making it clear that, hey, it's still the talent still lies in Eugene, Oregon here. I think that the Ducks are absolutely still the favorites in the Pac-12. We've seen the Pac-12 be left out of the playoffs the last few years. Is this a year, if Oregon goes in, win or lose, if they play respectably, right. does that help their playoff chances? Well, I mean, I think at the end of the day, the, the committee uh, is trying to be unbiased, but I think everybody else is biased in the whole process. And I think everybody sees the Pac-12 as the weakest link. They didn't do a great job the first week. Obviously, we talked about UCLA did okay against LSU, but LSU was in no way, shape, or form the same LSU team, and they had a tough year last year. Uh, I, I I think the Pac-12's out. I, 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 don't, I think it's going to be you have to either run the table or you have to have something catastrophic happen in the rest of the country where you're going to somehow get two losses in front of you. But I still think to this day that if Oregon loses to Ohio State and wins out and they win the Pac-12, then they should at least be in the conversation in the I think the pact I think every power five school should be in the conversation if they win it, if they win their conference. Sure. Um, but let's say you have a situation where people do or teams do lose in front of you and you're sitting there with one loss and your one loss is to Ohio State and you play the who's got the best loss uh, game, then maybe Oregon's in the conversation. But. I also think Oregon could be got this year by a team, and then just like we saw with a couple of three years ago with Arizona State late in the season, where it looks like you could be on track even with the loss. That's the year they started with the loss to Auburn. Even with the loss, you're still in the conversation. As soon as you get that second loss, you're out. So if they go undefeated, yeah, they should be in the conversation for sure. And if they'll they, have they'll have to go unbeaten after the Ohio State. But, oh, of course. I guess the point I was trying to make is. This is by no means an eliminator entirely for Oregon on no, Saturday. No. Yeah. No, but but I also do think that if that is the conversation, people are going to use that against them as well and say, oh, uh, you know, they couldn't beat Ohio State then. How are they going to compete with teams in the playoff now? Mm -hmm. uh, that's the caliber of team you're going to play in the playoffs, and they can't do it then, so why not? So I just, uh, I just think the Pac-12 and the Oregon Ducks have to do something major to change that perception. Three, three significantly tough. I'm not putting Stanford in the tough category this year after what I saw on Saturday, no. Kansas State. But three tough road games I'm looking at here, Ryan, at UCLA on October 23rd. I would have put Washington in the category. Was it what, what the hell happened to the Huskies Montana. against Montana? I know. What happened, uh, dude? Uh, that Husky was such were, a weird game. <laughs> Husky fans were very loud last year. Uh, after the COVID situation, the whole off season, Husky fans were very loud and they were very quiet quickly. I mean, Montana is a good team on their level. Don't get FCS, me wrong, yep. but sure. But I don't think that should ever happen. That level of talent gap, not to mention the fact that it's the first week and you're bringing in fans for the first time, the greatest setting in college football, which I agree with. And I think it's, I think it's a major, major place. Uh, but that was brutal. I mean, they scored seven points. They, they literally could have won the game at the end. They got beat by Montana kicking field goals. I mean, that, that's harsh. Yeah, 13-7, thir to seven, the Grizz go up to Seattle and upset the Huskies. Now, to some SEC fans who are going to hear you say Washington is the greatest setting in college football, can, can you elaborate on that? Okay, so the re they, they claim that. So that's their claim. Yeah. Um, and the reason why is because you're in, a, you're in a major metropolitan city, a beautiful city of Seattle. And it's on the lake. Uh, this this area of Mont Lake, where yep. beautiful. I mean, yep. they they bring the yachts over and sailgate and do all. It's 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 beautiful. Now, I I think there's better um, atmospheres of college football. I think there's better environments, uh, stadiums, all those things. But as they say, setting. It's really the landscape we're talking about. We're talking about major metropolitan city in downtown on the lake. I mean, we're talking multi 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 million dollar real estate here that just happens to be 
for the university that's been there for a hundred years. Um, and, uh, and, and, and that's their, that's their thing. They're on the lake. It affects the, the game tremendously. You get the lake effect. It's cold. It's rainy. Um, it's a great setting and they've done a lot to improve that. They also have redone their stadium and they've done a lot to improve it. But, um, I personally like the bowl setting much better than the open air stadiums. I, I tend to think that, uh, the t- being all tucked in together in the bowl is the best environment, uh, or atmosphere. Yeah, I'm, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not sure their stadium's the best looking college football, but certainly Google Google image the Washington Huskies football state. It's pretty unbelievable. The ducks. So the ducks go up there November six, and then they got a road trip at the end of the year to Utah, which could be pretty nice. tough. Pretty tough one there, especially at that time of year. You're gonna get some cold weather up in those mountains there. So I, outside of those three road trips, Ryan, that's a fairly manageable schedule I'm looking at for the Ducks right now. Totally agree. And I I do think that Utah has to get their respect. I think they have probably the best coaching staff in the league uh, or one of. uh, I think they are solid every single year. They don't lose a lot of their coaches. They have got great tradition there. Um, They coach up their D-line incredibly. They have the Samoan pipeline as well. They do a tremendous job of recruiting. Uh, Their guy, their type of guy, might not be a five-star might not be the four-star guy that some other schools are going after. They're going after their type of guy, and it works for them. They've got their blueprint. Uh, that's going to be a very difficult game. That's going to be the one that I, I said at the beginning of the year, that's the one I look at is I don't, I'm not really looking forward to. I actually, to begin the year, I thought Oregon would, would, would play well at UCLA. They usually historically always play well at LA, no matter if it's uh, uh, USC or um, UCLA. But the UCLA team looked good. And me being a Chip fan myself, because of Chip Kelly's time here, um, I'm scared of that offense. And it, 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 because I know how powerful that can be, and uh, they look like they have it rolling there. So um, I'm I'm excited for that game. That game historically is a little lackluster because they don't fill that stadium up even close at all. There's probably going to be 30, 35,000 people at that game. Maybe now that the Ducks and the there it'll be a top 25 matchup. Maybe there'll be 50, but. That it's not going to be rocking at all. Um, and that's just what, how it is in L.A. What are some of the differences you've seen with Chip Kelly's UCLA offense? I mean, really, it, they've been they've been building. So I almost don't even want to count until I'm – first couple games, would you, like LSU game the other night, I think Hawaii was just completely overwhelmed. I watched that game, and there were the gaps that we could have run through some of those holes that those line, that line was creating at UCLA. But he's gotten a lot of praise for really building that offensive line, and they become a pretty physical team. What are some differences between what he's doing at UCLA and what he did at Oregon? Well, first and foremost, I think he has a better defense. Uh, I think the defense last year was very talented. I have some question marks about their defense this year, but they look really good early. Mm-hmm. Um, offensively, though, it's weird. You know, he he people thought of him as this like mad scientist, uh, huge playbook, um, all this sort of stuff. He would run like five plays. And he would run the same play over. He'd run the same play over and over three times in the same down. I mean, in the same series. He'd just, next, next. They, you could see they're just lining up for the exact same play again. Again. They did it against Auburn. They ran the same play three times on the goal line and were stopped each time. So there's a there was a hard-headedness with Chip where he just thought, my play's going to work. It doesn't matter. His playbook was actually fairly tight. And it was very old school. People thought of him as being this guy who created all this stuff. No, he dusted off the old Carlisle Indians playbook. He went back to the old school. And his running game was incredible. One of the things that he did at Oregon was he talked about and had their offensive line talk about, because he, he inherited the same offensive line coach for years that's now, or was, went over to Cal as well. Now he's retired, but Coach Greatwood. And he, he changed the offensive line completely. And how he did it was to try to catch edges. He wasn't really concerned with blocking the entire person. He was only really concerned with blocking the corners and the edges and creating gaps. And they would create huge holes. And we know about it because Michael James ran through all sorts of crazy holes. And we saw that big time at UCLA. So that's scary because he runs the ball better. He runs power, basically, better than Mario's running it at Oregon. And Mario's thinking that's their M.O. Nobody's thinking UCLA's M.O. is power. And they're running it three or four times uh, for a first down every single series. So I do also think that uh, DTR is a perfect quarterback for his system. Not necessarily wants to run. He's a pass-first guy. But he's shifty enough, just shifty enough to be able to get out of the pocket. And that's when 
they can just eat teams up because as soon as you get out of the pocket, you make teams guess defensively, and there's always more guys open than guys who are closed off by the defense. And that's how Chip Kelly runs it. Well, they certainly impressed uh, last Saturday in, in those sissy blue shirts, as, as Coach <laughs> Ogeron would say. I love it. I love that clip. That guy cracks me up. I love Coach O, and, you know, he had he has some history out here now. You know, he, he, USC he, guy. You better believe it. So yeah. they, when he goes into U, UCLA, he doesn't see it the way an average SEC guy sees it. So there's a little bit of bad blood there. Well, UCLA, they have Fresno State this week, so we're going to see them against a common opponent. And then they got a couple tough matchups there. Arizona State, I, I'm not going to I'm not going to write off Washington completely. The road game up there is going to be tough for them still uh, before they play the Ducks. But something to keep on an eye on out in Pac-12 country. Ryan, incredible source of information there for Oregon football. Be sure to check out his channel, Sports Chat 503 on YouTube. Uh, just keeps it. Keeps it engaging, keeps it interesting about the Oregon Ducks all season. Ryan went to everybody. Ryan, tell them where they can find you in general. Yeah, man, sports chat. That's it, bro. I just I do my thing. I don't try to hype it that much. I don't promote it that much. I just I'm a regular guy. This is my basement. I own my own house. It's not my mom's house, you know. I'm in my <laughs> basement. But I just love doing what YouTube does and just providing an opportunity for fans to get together. I try to get guys on. I try to do interviews with you know, newspaper guys or other sort of bloggers, or whatever, but I also just try to get regular fans on talk or whatever, because I do think there's a lot of people who are really interested in these uh, topics and they got something to say. So out here on the West Coast, I think that we don't really get that much noise for us. So I try to make a little bit for us, but always try to do it respectfully and come at it from a sportsmanship point of view, uh, first and foremost. And I just love college football. I could talk about it for hours and hours. So can't thank you enough, man. I really appreciate you. Yeah, man, it shows. It shows. Well, hey, we appreciate you coming on and I'll have to find another other excuse to talk Oregon football with you and get you back on the show anytime all right take it easy man appreciate you bud let's wrap up the show with pick segment we're going to go over I'm going to pick 10 games but I'm also going to mention some games I'm keeping an eye on this weekend games of interest uh to, for one reason or another might not be the biggest games just games I'm throwing out there uh for you folks at home here uh, Friday night, because there's nothing on at Friday night <laughs> for football here. We got Coastal Carolina hosting Kansas at 7.30 on ESPN2. Uh, the Chanticleers, obviously great season last year, strong opener. Kansas gets its first win under Lance Leopold. Uh, not going to be a great game, most likely. Uh, the Chanticleers are four touchdown favorites approximately and uh they should roll in this one that is not one of my picks for the record just throwing that out there friday night if you need something to watch saturday at noon on fox we talked about it with ryan winter oregon and ohio state in the horseshoe buckeyes are 14 and a half point favorites they're certainly capable of a blowout in this game they can they can cer certainly run away with this but i'm a little nervous about that running defense. We saw Minnesota expose it, and there were times where the Buckeyes were just not doing enough to stop the run. I, I think this one, as Lee Corso might say, is going to be closer than the experts think. Ryan Winter himself, he thinks the Buckeyes are going to win by about two touchdowns. Um, I, 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 I'm worried about that defense, so we'll see, how, we'll see how it goes. Ohio State, I think they get the win, but I think Oregon covers – uh, you give me the Ducks in 14 and a half. I, I'm more than happy with that one. So we'll take the Oregon at plus 14 and a half. South Carolina goes to East Carolina, the same time slot on ESPN. On ESPN uh, two, you got Tennessee and Pitt. Uh, Pitt at minus three. I'm sorry, South Carolina is on ESPN two. Tennessee's on ESPN. Uh, Pitt at minus three in the Johnny Majors Bowl in Neyland Stadium. We get to see Tennessee face a test against a good Pitt team. This will be the week, though, where we really see how clear it is that just how big of a rebuild that Josh Heupel has on his hands on Rocky Top. Pitt covers, thanks to the experience of quarterback Kenny Pickett, Pitt minus three. Florida, USF, 1 p.m. ABC, the Gators at minus 29. And there wasn't a thing I learned about the USF team this week that's going to keep me from picking the Gators to cover in this one. Um those late TDs that I referenced a week ago when I picked FAU to cover got burned on a couple late TDs by Todd Grantham, Grantham's defense over the last year here. I'm not concerned about that this week. I think that FAU roster was stronger than this USF roster. 
Uh, Florida is looking ahead to Alabama in a good way, I feel like. I think this is going to be a tune-up, and the Gators are going to be sharp, use a strong performance early in the day in Tampa, take that ride home to Gainesville, and and just rest up on Saturday, get ready to start that Bama prep on Sunday. Uh, Gators minus 29, official pick there. UAB at Georgia, the number two Bulldogs, 330 ESPN2. We know what they can do on defense. Got to see it on offense. UAB has been one of the stronger teams in Conference USA. So not a total pushover for the dogs, but I want to see what JT Daniels does when he's not facing one of the best defenses in the country. Texas A&M out Colorado, 330 p.m. on Fox. The Aggies are 17-point favorites. And for those of us who weren't rushing to watch the Kent State game, it'll be a good opportunity to get a live look at new Aggies quarterback, Haynes King. He threw three picks. wasn't a big issue. But let's see if he cuts back on the mistakes in this one. Colorado surprised us last season in year one of Carl Durrell, one of the better performances for a new coach in 2020. But the Buffaloes should be flat out outmatched in this one. Talent-wise, AM, they're striving to become Bama, right? They want to ch- – they're chasing Bama in the West. Look at it this way. Would Bama sweat about covering 17 going out to Boulder? I know this is a spread I would have no inclination to trust the Aggies with in years past. But let's call this uh, a leap of faith in, in Jimbo Fisher. As Jimbo Fisher is developing this program, I think the Aggies are certainly capable of covering this number. Let's see if they go out to Boulder and perform as six, uh, expected. I'm going to give the Aggies the nod at minus 17. Buffalo goes to Nebraska at 330 on the Big Ten Network. Careful, Oscars. No, uh, Buffalo is one of the better teams in the MAC last season. Don't sleep on them. Don't sleep on them. Cal goes to TCU 330 on ESPNU. TCU at minus 11. I don't question Cal's ability to keep it close on defense. I do question Cal's ability to score on offense, though. And part of me wants to take TCU because I don't think they'll have to put up a huge number to cover 11 points. But if their cheese it bull nightmare of a defensive struggle uh, tells you anything, it's just that maybe you should give the defense the benefit of the doubt when Justin Wilcox and Gary Patterson get together. Uh, I'm going to do that. Cal. Let's get them to cover the 11 in Fort Worth. Cal minus 11, or Cal plus 11, I'm sorry. Uh, Air Force goes to Navy at 3.30 on CBS. September 11th is, of course, on Saturday. I'm sure you'll see uh, some pregame ceremonies before that Air Force-Navy game uh, that you won't want to miss, and CBS will be carrying that at 3.30 p.m. Uh, 4 p.m. on the SEC Network, Mercer goes to Bama. No, I don't care about this game itself, but if you wish to get one final look at the Crimson Tide before they go to Gainesville next week, that's your chance. 4.30 p.m., ABC, number 10, Iowa, number 9, Iowa State. The Cyclones are four-and-a-half-point favorites in this one. And even though this rivalry dates back to 1899, these two schools, they did not play between 1934 and 1977. Iowa did not lose a game in the series between 1983 and, and 1997. But since 1998, Iowa holds a 12-10 to 10 lead in the series, and they've won the last five. But the last three have been decided by a total of 14 points. I'm guessing it's going to be a close game here as Iowa State has picked up their game in recent years under Matt Campbell. But on top of overcoming their big brother, Iowa State is hosting college game day with the eyes of the nation upon them. They're not used to this scene in Ames, Iowa. I I know Iowa State's done a good job of handling a big stage when the weight of expectations are not on them, but you got that preseason number nine. You're in the top ten. Expectations come along with it. Played an ugly game in the opener against Northern Iowa. Of course, they lost to Louisiana last year to open the season, ended up having a nice year. So I'm not going to read too much into it. But Iowa looked fantastic, and I said I wasn't going to sleep on the Hawkeyes again. So if you're giving me that Hawkeyes team and the points to go into Ames, play loose and relax with less expectations, even though they're number 10 in the country right now, I I think this Iowa program, I I think they're ready to uh, go in there and deal the Iowa State a loss. So we'll see. We'll see how that goes. But I'll take Iowa in the points in the meantime. Texas goes to Arkansas, 7 p.m. ESPN. Loved what Arkansas did last year. Loved what Texas did last Saturday. Arkansas last Saturday, Saturday, not so much. This All offseason, I thought that this was going to be my upset for week two, picking Arkansas over Texas. But Texas is a seven-point favorite in this one. Uh, and Arkansas just struggled mightily with Rice before they got their act together with the big second half. They ended up taking the Owls down. They moved to 1-0. and 
Sam Pittman squad. They look like they're going to be able to give Texas a game, but I like the way Texas handled themselves against Louisiana this past week. They, they did what they should. They took care of business in the second half. And again, even though I love the hogs in the preseason to pull the upset after what I saw last Saturday, not, not so much, not so much. So I'll take Texas to cover uh, the Longhorns at minus seven. At 7 p.m. on ESPNU, Appalachian State goes to Miami to face the Hurricanes. I just want to check in and see if Bama broke Miami. We saw him broke it, break FSU a few years ago, but I, I you know, 19 point dogs in that game for Miami. I, I'm not stressing too much if I'm a Canes fan in this one. I want to see De'Aaron King bounce back, have a nice game, and he, he's going to be the definition. Like it's all on King. How's Miami going to do this season? Are they they got a shot to win their division? In the ACC, we saw Virginia Tech pull the upset with North Carolina. There's no clear-cut favorite. Miami is definitely one of those teams in the hunt right now. But take care of business at home against Appalachian State. You also got a game coming up here in in the next couple weeks with this Michigan State team that just went to Northwestern. So, you know, time to get together. You'll be able to build up some confidence, Miami. You'll be able to build it up before ACC play starts. Missouri goes to Kentucky, 730 ESPN. And little SEC action, East action early in the season here, but let's see if Will Levis will follow up on that 367-yard performance passing, uh, four touchdowns as well through the air. Uh, hey, Shane Matthews, Kentucky has a quarterback that can throw now. Maybe maybe you'll pay attention to them a little bit. Uh, I, I That was against Louisiana Monroe. Let's see how he handles the SEC secondary. Uh, McNeese State goes to LSU at 8 p.m. on ESPN+. Plus. Only worth mentioning because Coach O's son is the quarterback at McNeese State. You don't get to see that very often. Washington goes to Michigan, 8 p.m. ESPN. The Wolverines are seven-point favorites in this one. The Huskies lost to Montana to start the season versus Michigan, living up to expectations and covering. I, I hate this game. I hate this game. I, I'm not. I, neither one of those factors are fun to think about. Uh, but I'll go against my better judgment and trust the Jim Harbaugh Wolverines to actually live up to expectations and cover a spread against Washington at minus seven. So I'll take the Wolverines to the big house. In general, a lot weaker slate in week two than week one, in my opinion. But the 10 p.m. time slot and later, you got some interesting games going on. Uh, we'll start off at 10 p.m. on the CBS Sports Network. You don't get to see Vandy travel out west too much. They go to Colorado State. Uh, you might want to check them out for a series or two. I realize Vandy, Colorado State is not going to pique a ton of interest, but let's just check in on the Commodores, see how they handle themselves against the Mountain West. Utah and BYU get together at 10.15 on ESPN. The Utes are seven-point favorites. Utes look like one of the better teams in the Pac-12 South this year. Expecting them to contend for the Pac-12 title. Uh, I think they're too much for BYU. Too much turnover for BYU. We saw them struggle with an Arizona team that's not expected to do much this year last week. Uh, they just have too much to replace, I think. New quarterback, new off, new offensive coordinator. Great season in 2020, but this Utah team is for real. I think they're too much for BYU, and I'll take Utah to cover at minus seven in the Holy War. One of the better names for uh, a rivalry game. Uh, that concludes my picks for this week, but I do want to throw out a couple more late games for you. Stanford at USC, 1030 on Fox. How will the Trojans uh, uh, handle handle the Cardinal? I think, I, I think just fine. I think they'll get by that game with no issue. Arizona State hosts UNLV. Let's check in on Herm Edwards, see how they're doing at 1030 on ESPN2. And finally, you got an 11 a.m. kickoff with Illinois and Virginia. You got an 11 p.m. kickoff with Hawaii and Oregon State on FS1. So you'll have plenty of college football to watch on Saturday. You can go well after 2 in the morning with this one. And uh, looking forward to another week of college football here. I want to thank Will Turner from Bulls 24-7 for joining us, as well as Ryan Winter from Sports Chat 503. We previewed the Florida USF game and the Oregon Ohio State game. Looking forward to another podcast next week. And in the meantime, go Gators.